we are live let's make sure we're everything's working i got a notification we're live we're live yes again it's good enough yeah george is lucky he came in you know at the the second half of season three where we have much <laughs> less technical difficulty <laughs> less we cursing to... <laughs> a lot less cursing <laughs> we we used a lot of well, skype is new for us this year so We've had a, a lot of challenges, but anyway, you Mark, let's talk about the the topic, the the pre-show topic. The pre-show topic is. <laughs> let me see if I want to get the script. Spy hunter, what is he hunting? <laughs> <laughs> okay, George, go. <laughs> um, uh, you know that's a good question. <laughs> that's a really good question. <laughs> Back then. Um, you know, back then we um, uh, sometimes we made a list of words um, and we make, mix and matched words. And and honestly, that's where that came from. Nice. So Chalk. Not, really, not really hunting too many spies, but no. Uh, right, right. So would you just do do it on a chalkboard or what? What was that? No, situation? I used to write them down. I used to you know left column, right column, and and play with the you know, play with the combinations. Do you recall I, any rejected names for that thing? For Spy Hunter? Um, no, but I, I think, I, I believe it or not, somewhere in my archives, I actually have stuff like that. So I can oh. probably, um, probably dig it out. But, you know, Satan's Hollow came about that way also. Nice. Oh, cool. Um, so we're, you know, we had, you know, somebody, you know, we tried all these different combinations and somebody liked Oh yeah, you know Satan's Hollow. That sounds great. So, <laughs> turned out turned out it didn't work so it didn't work so well for us because the world was different and everyone in the uh, in the Bible Belt had an issue with uh, with Satan on the on the cabinet <laughs> and, um, and and on the you know and on the in the title. Yeah. Right. Could have been called uh, like a dirty bat hollow maybe that would have. Oh, but <laughs> Satan is in it. Okay, never mind. <laughs> Sorry, I don't know why I'm offering these uh, these al alternatives. It's I mean it's funny that they I mean I can understand why they'd have a problem with it, but that is one of the nicer side arts on a game. I mean that that side art is really phenomenal on that cabinet. Yeah, um, uh, Paul Niemeyer is the artist, and Paul has just uh, come to light because he did some of the uh, still work on Mortal Kombat. Oh, nice. Oh. And so he's, and you know, he he sort of left the business back then in the in the nineties, and uh, sort of uh, came back. Uh, just or somebody just discovered him, so to speak. And so he's <laughs> been attending a lot of he's been attending a lot of shows. <clears throat> nice. So <clears throat> when I was hunting a spy hunter, <laughs> I was uh, probably about ten years ago, and I found this spy hunter in Georgia, and I wanted a cockpit. And this guy, the only thing in the world he wanted for this cockpit spy hunter was a Rygar board set. Not a Rygar, just a Rygar board set. And I didn't have one. So that night, a local that has like games for sale all the time named Gary put a Rygar up on Craigslist. And I'm like scrambling, going crazy to get this thing. I call this guy in Georgia, tell him I've got a Rygar board set. I've got to go out to the East Coast anyways. And I take a open trailer and build a cover for it that is custom cover to fit a <laughs> cockpit spy hunter on this trailer. <laughs> so I build this wooden box on this open trailer, right? With like a rubber roof. And I drive down there. I show up at two o'clock in the morning and the guy comes out and all of his friends are there with him and they all start handing him money. And I'm like, what the hell's going on? He goes, Oh, I bet all of them that you were going to show up. They bet me you wouldn't. And so yes. he won like $200. I hand him this Rygar board set. And we roll this cockpit spy hunter out in my in my uh, trailer I've made. So I go. So I'm driving from Georgia up to Connecticut. So I'd gone from Minnesota to Georgia. I was doing the U-Haul or the uh, U-Ship thing at the time. So I was making all this money on the way, picking up stuff, dropping off things. So I, I drive up to Connecticut, and on the way between Georgia and Connecticut, you've got to go across the George Washington Bridge, right? Well, this is within like you know six years or so of 9/11. And here I am with this giant wooden box on, <laughs> like that I've built on a trailer. And before I know it, I've got this police escort of like five cars behind me. 
And they're like right. waving me down on the bridge. Now, the stupid part was they pulled me over like on the bridge, right? Which is like, if right. you're going to do this, that's like the wrong sure. place to do it. Yeah. So the guys come up to the window and there's like, an, like a cop about my age and a really young cop. And the, the cop my age is sitting at the window, and he's he goes, "Hey, what 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 do you have in that thing? I mean, what is this? This doesn't look right." <laughs> and I look at him, I go, "I've I've got a cockpit spy hunter in the trailer," and he just looks at me and he goes, "No shit." <laughs> <laughs> so what? we we go. He goes, "I gotta inspect the trailer. You know, it's just we have to." So I mean, there's like police lights everywhere. This younger cop goes back with us. The older cop goes back. And I had I had screwed the back of this trailer on. It didn't have, like, hinges, right? I just had, like, plywood boards that were screwed in with, like, security screws. So I undo the top board, pull it down. He stands up on it. He looks in there, and he goes, that's so beautiful. <laughs> and, he, and he gets back down, and he goes, you can close it back up. The younger cop looks at him and goes, we got to inspect the trailer. He turns and goes, son, there's no way that somebody is going to blow up a cockpit spy hunter and a terrorist has one of these. <laughs> oh, my God. And they let me go. That's great. So so then after this episode, I had this thing in the trailer. I spent a, a month in, a, in a, well, not Boston, in Worcester, actually, Mass, at an away uh, rotation. And I left the trailer at my mom's house. It's in Connecticut. And I would drive down on the weekends, run an extension cord out to the trailer, and sit in the trailer and play Spy Hunter. <laughs> so does it still work? Well, so the really sad part, of, the really sad part about this is that about uh, eight years ago, uh, when I moved, so I, when I went to residency, we moved all of my games that I, I treasured into my dad's basement, which is a finished basement, thinking they'll be safe here. My dad has an indoor pool and forgot to turn the hose off one night and flooded the entire basement and wiped out my spy hunter, which then led to a second search for a spy hunter, which oh. was not nearly as entertaining as the first one. But it was, it, it was, it really was a, a, that adventure was, I mean, and there's a whole slew of stories of like dropping off Harley Davidson's and picking up scooters and everything else, but it was it was really kind of one of those trips where it was crazy. I have this one picture I stopped and dropped off. I picked up, sorry, this Trans Am hood in Tennessee. And when I went there, like you go in the house and like the house was on the edge of this river and half of the house was just gone. Right? Like the river had come by, wiped out the it embankment, does. and he's like, Oh, I've got the I've got the hood over here. <laughs> but you, did you guys did you guys ever see the Pontiac commercial? The Spy Hunter Pontiac commercial? No. no. Uh, it's on my Facebook. It's on my Facebook page. So, you know, at, uh, when when we're all done with all of this, I'll I'll show it to you. But so in it must have been in the early 2000s. It must have been. No, actually, it was uh, later. It was uh, it had to be like 07, something like that. Pontiac was still alive as a as as a car company, <laughs> and they yeah. were introducing a car. I think it was the G8, and they called Midway. And they said, hey, we, the demographic for the G8 is the demographic that was playing Spy Hunter when they were 10. And <laughs> so we, we want to do this commercial. And they did a commercial. And it's pretty awesome. I mean, you guys are going to love it when you have it. I have it on, like I said, it's on my, it's on my Facebook page. You can, you can go up there and, and, and check it out. But it's, it's pretty awesome. And I was like, they, they asked me, is this okay? I said, yeah, absolutely. This is great. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but yeah, somebody did a really, really nice job with it. Awesome. Nice. Well, I, I think this is time where we kick off the show and uh, we get things ro rolling. What do you guys, what do you guys think about that? Let's do it. All right. Live from KOYR Studios in Minneapolis, Minnesota, this is Arcade Radio. Hello, Commander. Computer reporting. Intruder alert, Stimulated by 
opponent. Hello and welcome to Season 3, Episode 21 of the Arcade Radio Podcast. Today is Thursday, July 25th, 2019, and the time is now approximately 7.22 p.m. Central. Thanks for joining us in the Arcadosphere. This is your host, Adam the First. I'm joined by my co-host, Mark Timerner Shields, the second in Paradise Arcade Shop proprietor and professional mover in training, Mr. Brian Thurston Howell the <laughs> Third. And tonight, our guest host is an inventor. He's an industrial designer. He's the creator of both pinball and video games. He's the real deal, folks. A true quadruple threat and more. Ladies and gentlemen, we present to you Mr. George Gomez. Welcome to the show. Hello, everybody. <laughs> thanks for having me on. Oh, thanks for being here. We're very honored to have you here. Uh, so the first first segment is called uh, What You've Been Working On. We talk a little bit about what we've been working in the hobby. Uh, Brian, why don't you kick it off? Uh, well, let's see. So today we moved roughly 150 games from one warehouse to another one. That was a lot of fun. No. Uh, so we just took over this the other side of our building, and we're rapidly uh, moving games from the warehouse. So we don't have to pay August rent in our storage warehouse. So <laughs> that's uh, that's been a lot of fun. Well, that'd be fun. Aside from, oh, what was that? Well, what happened to? Uh, I have a couple games over there. Are they are they yeah. still there? I mean, like. Do- pack- we, we were a little cold last night, so we had a little bonfire, you know, but I've got pieces left. You, uh, Metal scraps. <laughs> Angry face. Angry face. <laughs> and aside from that, as far as games that I've been working on, um, let's see. What was the last one I fixed? I can't even remember at this point because we moved so many of them around. Mm -hmm. Uh, Essentially, actually, the one that I'm working on right now sitting here on the desk is I'm rebuilding my food fight joysticks. So the player one, I have a cocktail. The player one side worked okay. And the player two side, I went in there and there was really like a joystick handle coming out of the machine. I never tested it. And that was about it. Like everything underneath is there but not connected. So when I started moving it to play the player two side, it was just, yeah, it was very disappointing. Mm -hmm. Sounds disappointing. Mark, Aww. what have you been working on? Mark? Who, who me? Oh, God, yeah. so much stuff right here. I'll go real fast. <laughs> okay. So I've been trying to open an arcade. and oh, Yeah, uh, awesome. That, Tell yeah. us about your new arcade. Well, it's called Timeline Junction, and at some point it'll have several themes, one 1985, one 1955, one 1885. Obviously, the 1985 one will be an arcade. Anyway, so I learned <laughs> that Ross Clothing Stores... Nothing to do with the the TV show Friends, by the way. They don't like entertainment. So if you try to open something that offers entertainment in the same shopping center, they will put the kibosh on on it, and then you won't get to go there. Mm-hmm. So that's that's kind of interesting. They don't they 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 do call out arcades specifically, but they're like entertainment in general. They don't want to see it. like a movie theater. They don't want to be in that lot. So that's so that's kind of fun. I learned that. Um, I, I picked up a plywood Donkey Kong in rural Texas. Nice. Um, that was fun. It was a, I got lost only three times. It's one of those where you, you they say, "Hey, there's a there's an unmarked dirt road," and then you know, like right around where they said it was, there's like five unmarked dirt roads. So you just start going down one, and then and then you know when the kid on the uh, with the banjo starts playing, you back the truck up, and then you try another one. <laughs> That's the second <laughs> reference I've heard to Deliverance this week. <sighs> um i'm picking up a wizard of war 300 miles away on sunday and that one seems pretty straightforward i think that that's like a there's good landmarks there so i'm excited about that and my arcade band is playing at the game preserve clear lake nasa location which is opening this weekend hopefully if they pass their inspection um and that's we we go on friday and saturday night at 9 p.m many arcade related games songs I mean, uh, originals, but... Most excellent. Yes. Aren't you working on a particular song right now? Pinball Wizard. Oh. Uh, I play the bass guitar, so it's like four notes and then another three notes, so it's pretty fun. The Elton John version or the Who version? The Who. Okay, good, good. Yes, yes. Excellent. Uh, excellent. Uh, ex- excellent. <laughs> okay. That's it. I- that's it. I don't have anything else. All right, yeah, I'll well, go next. I'll, I'll talk go about next. stuff next time. I got all kinds of stuff <laughs> this time. Guess what? I fixed my Robotron. It's been a saga, but huh. it's fixed. Uh, sound problem. 
uh, inter- intermittent sound problem. When uh, turns out, uh, uh, I went to Clav because I was so uh, ups- you know I was so confounded because it was such an intermittent problem. It'd come on and then it would just go away, and then it wouldn't come back. Until like maybe a couple days later, or if I reseeded a bunch of chips, or you know whatever, mm. I couldn't figure it out. Uh, it turns out after uh, replacing a bunch of sockets uh, that it was uh, a bad socket uh, uh, on the CPU board. The 6809 processor MPU was uh, not getting a good connection, so there was either a problem with the address line or or something. So uh, that fixed it, which is irritating because it's nice when you have a problem that's common uh it's not nice when you don't have one that's common but pretty much everything in that machine's been replaced over the last couple of weeks because it's got a brand new hacko uh setup so i got all new hacko soldering iron i got the 301 desoldering iron, oh, and i got the, the exited the dark ages yeah i did i got the solder sucker <laughs> i could do repairs in like half the time I, I everyone always says you should get the 301 man you should get the 301 and i i started out with that dumb you know like I don't know what it is. It looks like a syringe, you know, and it, it's terrible. And oh and then you had the Radio Shack bulb. I upgraded to that, and I used that oh for my years. God. And then I got this Chinese knockoff of the Hacko, which worked okay until it didn't really work really well. And then I was, like, redoing solder work, and I was just like, this is taking too much. And I go over to Brian's shop, and he's got a Hacko uh, desoldering iron there, and I try it out, and I'm like, this is brilliant. I I could do like sixty <laughs> desolder like a minute. So anyway, uh, I was really excited to get the sound working on the on the, and then we also solved another problem uh, on the Robotron, which was uh, I bought one of the Paradise Arcade Shop drop-in replacement power supplies, which are really cool. They uh, they sit in the same spot as the uh, linear power supply, uh, work great in the uh, in the upgrade in the uprights, but it turns out. That the Robotron cocktail is wired differently than the upright. So instead of a 15-pin connector coming off the transformer, it's got a 12-pin connector, which doesn't even touch the three pins that provide illumination to all the upright dedicated Williams machines, which is 6.3 volts uh, to the illumination. Uh, They actually, for some reason, decided to use the 11.5 volts instead on the cocktail, uh, so a 12 volt bulb is required, and then they uh, on the linear power supply, which I could show you right here. This little guy, you know, there's a couple little jumpers, and they are located right above the fuses, and they're W2 and W3, and they are intact, and it's just a couple of uh, zero ohm resistors that act as jumpers, and what they did is they jumped uh, pins 11 and 12. Uh, to f- uh, 14 and 15, and then that provides the 12 volt power uh, for your illumination. So, a uh, lesson learned: uh, if you have a cocktail, Williams, be be wary of this because it might use 12 volt for the illumination. So, anyway, uh, that's enough tech talk, I guess, for now. Uh, hey, George, what have you been working on? Oh, you know this and that. Um... <laughs> <laughs> that you can talk about. Yeah. What, what can just, you tell uh, us that's but, upcoming that uh, that you've been working on? Um, so you know, at Comic Con, just uh, last weekend, we uh, we launched the consumer version of our Star Wars uh, product. Cool. Um, so it's a it's an entirely new line, um, basically aimed at um, aimed uh, strictly as a consumer game, designed strictly as a consumer game, lower price point, um, different. Um, different audience than our traditional hardcore audience, sort of designed to to uh, engage uh, new players in pinball. So and, Williams uh, did that back in the day, right? They had a Fireball Home Edition. Uh, Bally, Bally, Bally. Okay, sorry. Yeah, Bally did that. So, is it, is this a new thing for Stern? Um, it is a thing that we've toyed with. Um, so we've we've made. We made a small run of tr- of Transformers and Avengers about five, maybe six years ago. Um, at that t- at that particular moment in time, the the thinking was to go even even lower in terms of pricing. And and what we found is that 
that they felt too much like a toy and not enough like a pinball machine. So we uh, we took another we took another pass at it. We did an experimental run of Spider-Man games about two years ago, and they felt more like a pinball. Um, and you know, part of cracking part of of cracking into a new segment of the market like that is sort of exploring how um, not not just the manufacturing issues and the you know the, the trying to get the bill of materials um, to the to the right uh, to the right number, but also uh, we have to understand uh, what the sales channel is going to do and how they're going to deal with it, um, how consumers going to react to it. It's a, because it's it's really outside of of the our standard channel, and so uh, when we did the Spider Man, we did it in such a way that um, we could learn from it purposely small run just about learning and now i think we've got it so um you know we launched uh, we launched a star wars product and um uh, pretty happy with uh, with the response i got that's cool that is great hey who who's tasked with um acqu- acquiring licenses like do you guys decide what you like and you go and see if you can get it or yeah there's that? um i mean so you know i've i've felt I've always felt very strongly that design teams have to be passionate about the stuff they're working on. So um, the last thing I want is is to you know hand somebody something and say here go make a game because it's it's you just don't get the same the same level of passion. So the teams have to be invested in what they're doing. So some of the you know some of the um, the company has a vision about. Um, addressing different segments of the market throughout the course of the year we, we do what we call cornerstone games we do three a year and those games have three price points um, the pro price point is what you'll see on the street you know most likely it's intended for operators um, quick ROI it's a it's a it's a um, it's a game with less content and less depth and then the premiums and limited editions are full-blown games with um, with everything um, so uh, the, uh, there's, we, we get offered all the licenses by uh, clearly, um, every licensor is trying to pitch their license. And so we see everything that's coming and we determine, you know, Hey, we think this fits our market. We've got, you know, designers raise their hand for it. And, um, you know, we make some determination. What do we think are the best three, um, in any given year? Um, you know, we've had a lot, we've had a lot of luck with music licenses. So we, you know, we keep going, we keep, um, going back to that. Um, and of course we're big fans of the MCU. Marvel's been, you know, Marvel's been very good to us and, and, uh, we've had, you know, we've had great luck with them. Um, so, you know, we do every once in a while, we do something niche, uh, that is not a cornerstone. Like we did the Beatles, mm-hmm. uh, last year. You know, those products are, you know, we did, and we also have a private label line. Like we did that. I don't know if you've ever seen the Supreme product, but the Supreme Pinball machines, those things, you know, we made a very small number, like, and, and it, that's a case where um, a brand approaches us and say, make us a product. They sell the product. And all we do is guarantee that it's, you know, it's a stern pinball. Um, and so it feels like, uh, et cetera. And those Supreme games um, sold out in literally minutes, and they they were they were an expensive game. They were like ten thousand dollar game uh, from Supreme, and they were instantly trading uh, for huge numbers. I, I think I think one of them sold for a hundred thousand dollars. And Whoa. if you, I see them all the time, you know Ed Robertson has one, um, you know bare naked, bare naked ladies, and he was telling me that he's been offered stupid money for his, <laughs> for his Supreme. So, so uh, they're up on eBay right now for fifty five and sixty thousand dollars. Sure, sure, yeah. Cool. Yeah. Well, let's move on to the next segment and save the rest of these types of questions for the interview. Um, not to cut everybody off, but we we have a couple of things we want to get through because we want to focus on George. So uh, here it comes. Here comes the news. <laughs> Channel. Hostage. Israel. Government. Business merger. Refugee. Oil supply. Defense. The Klan. Education. Strike. Crime. Riot. Candid science. Celebrity. The Still Earth. The, the News Channel. Today I'm Bob Kang. Okay. I have on Jim Walker's system. This is the News Channel. We interrupt the federal interval. And now, the Arcade News with Brian McLeod. 
Welcome to the news. We're going to start off here talking about the Arcade 1-Up has officially opened up pre-orders for their Star Wars Home Arcade cabinet. What? It's revealed back at E3 in 2019, which is this year. Hmm. Um, <clears throat> but So this article is from bleedingcool.com. Um, essentially, you can buy these for $500. Uh, they're being sold exclusively through GameStop. And it'll feature, feature all three of the original uh, Star Wars arcade games, Return of the Jedi, Empire Strikes Back, as well as Star Wars. So you're going to have one raster and two vector games on one cabinet. Do we know if the yoke is going to be the same? You know, so the the word on the street was that the yoke they showed off at E3 was the Allen 1 yoke, which is a reproduction yoke of the Star Wars games. The only difference between the Allen 1 and the original yokes, aside from it being a reproduction, is that the Allen 1 used all aluminum gears. Versus the Delrin gears that were used on the original machine. So, um, why so would the they feel call would it be Alan good. One. That's, a tr- tr- that's a Tron call out, Ellen One. Why would they call it that? I don't get it. I, I don't know, actually. Because they're cool. Because they're cool. <laughs> <laughs> but, so we don't, we don't actually know what yoke is going to be on these machines. And there was some discussion on KLOV about whether or not uh, those guys would be providing the yokes. But considering an Allen One yoke costs $400. 350 now. 350 now. Hmm. Um, 350. Obviously, they're selling really well. That probably slowed down a little bit, <laughs> and the price drops. But uh, I actually have two of them. They're awesome, by the way. Cool. Uh, I really do like them. Uh, however, 350 for a yoke and a $500 cabinet might not necessarily work. And I don't know that those guys were going to kind of sell their shirts to get onto that cabinet. But there was some discussion about them talking to the one up guys. Interesting. Well, we'll keep our eye out and see what happens. Is anything else in the news pipe today? There is. I will say one last thing about the one-up cabinets. Uh, One of the interesting things about what has happened with them is uh, there's a huge amount of people buying them and then changing out all the controls. So it wouldn't surprise me if they went kind of low cost on a yoke and allowed people to do an aftermarket upgrade. Yeah. My buddy Joe buys all his parts for all of his one-ups from you. Yeah, it's it's amazing how many people buy those cabinets and then rip them apart like the day they get them. And I think it, it works really well for people that don't have a lot of space. So it does, you know, and I, and I know we've berated these cabinets, berated them, you know, on the air and all that stuff. But I I think there's a niche market for it. And then, you know, if you want to buy them and, and make them your own, uh, actually they're, they're, you know, that's awesome. And all it's done is made my buddy Joe, uh, who does this, uh, totally like start buying like real arcade cabinet stuff. So now he's got a, a bar top and a, I think he bought a full size that he's working on. Uh, a meme cabinet so it definitely has spiked the interest in uh, classic arcades although i do think it's funny when you go on facebook now and you look up arcade cabinet and half the stuff up there is one up cabinet oh. it's like oh <laughs> it's a no, little no, annoying no. Yes. that's a little annoying yeah. <laughs> i'm not shopping for that that's right uh, we will move on to uh so there's a fastcompany.com put up a an article and i'm gonna let uh george actually give us more information on this but stern is uh, it, it, of note, who now produces 90% of the world's uh, pinball machines, <laughs> is working on a connectivity system uh, for release later this year to connect pinball to the internet. Uh, so I, you know, I'm not going to nearly do this justice, but I thought I would let uh, George kind of fill in the blanks here and, and give us some details. Perfect. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's, you know, it's it's obvious, right? I mean, uh, there's uh, uh a ton of things that you can do when when the games are connected and we're building out um, an entire ecosystem of stuff uh, that will make the games uh, interactive in a new way and uh, you know it, we're, we're gonna do all of the usual things like you know support operators and and mine data and uh, you know download code updates and stuff but but the stuff I'm most interested about, you know, most most interested in, is the player-facing stuff. The stuff that the players that are going that's going to transform how players interact with the game. Um, I'm not at liberty to give you a lot of detail on the stuff we're doing just yet because we still have um, a little ways to go in terms of development. But um, um, I can tell you that I spent the whole day working on the stuff. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> is there is there any motivation from the way you can play head to head on NBA Fast Break that's possible, or is that still like? Yeah, you know that's uh, yeah that that will probably happen. <laughs> that will Sweet. probably. Happen. Oh, now I'm cool. really intrigued about this. I don't know. So one of the things I always thought would be fun to do because everybody's got the the you know talking about the high score save kits and linking to the internet. 
What would be fun to do is be able to pull in like world record scores onto your machines too. So not just uploading, which is what a lot yeah. of the systems do now, but be able to actually pull in scores and goals or whatever. And I know they do it with tournament modes on the pinball machines, but it's one of the things yeah. I've talked to. Uh, um, I've talked to a few of the uh, tech guys in the arcade world about doing that on old arcade cabinets and how that would be a neat feature to add and tie yeah. that into arcade and other things. Yeah, and I mean, you know, it's not a stretch to imagine that we're going to be doing things like that. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah, it's um, it's a really, it's a fairly robust feature set. The, the day we announce it, um, you know, on day one, it's not going to be all there. Um, but we're going to do, we're going to uh, do an announcement that basically um, um, lays out um, a, the, the entire rollout. So every so often cool. you're going to get, you know, you're going to get updates. You, you're going to know what you're getting. And um, and the games are it. I think I really believe it's going to be transformational for the for the genre, for the product. Um, I think it's going to be transformational in a lot of ways that we're going to design. And it's going to be transformational in a lot of ways that we can't even anticipate. Um, uh, and because that's the nature of the beast. So, so you can use like Windows as your example, right? You're like midway through a game and the window goes. Would you like to update your system right now? And everything shuts down, right? Uh, oh. <laughs> Let's hope not. <laughs> Let's hope not. <laughs> and then you restart, you restart your computer, and it's like a half hour later, it's like, update 10%. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, the, the best thing is, you know, you're going to do those updates in the middle of the night while you're sleeping. Yeah, nice. that's, that's, you know. <laughs> so. Right. <laughs> That's going to be a blast. Uh, can I ask you? So, um, this is an amazing, like this is an amazing idea, um, and it would make sense for Stern to do this on their machines and kind of what they're linked into. Is are they looking at doing this at more than just their modern machines? Are they doing any? Is there any interest in doing a tie-in back to some of the older machines, some of the older genres, or like expanding out to incorporate uh, some of the other systems? So I have to tell you that we're gonna. I mean. We're we're not going to go really far back. Um, yep. We are you know we are more than likely. So, the hardware that we ship today, yep, has basically got the stuff in it already. Um, yep. in Some ways, um, no one knows this, but if we unlocked a bunch of things in software and you plugged an Ethernet cable into it, you'd be you know your network would see it. So today, um, anything any any you know any what we call Spike Two game in the world does that already. Um, there are some other componentry that we're going to add that's going to make it really interesting. Um, and, and so I think that, I think we'll make a, we'll pick a cutoff date, but it, it, you know, it has a lot to do with, um, some of the things we're doing require a certain amount of processing power. They require a certain amount of memory. They require, um, just different, different tech that it, it really isn't, in our best interest to go really far back because yep. it's very costly. Sure. I just, I just want to be able to remotely like tilt the machine when somebody's getting close to my high score. So I can sit there across the room and watch them and be like, Boop, no, I'm sorry. You what? Can, you could just, okay. you could wire up an Arduino for that. that I could have used that tonight because on another podcast earlier in the week, somebody asked me about Deadpool, which is one of the games that, that I personally designed. And, and, um, you know, I'm 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 not I'm hardly a pinball wizard, meaning that that I, I'm the guys in my studio that work for me. I have some of the best players in the world. Right. So for me to get on the high score table in the arcade at Stern <laughs> is a big deal. Right. And so <laughs> I got you know, I got the number one position on a, on a Deadpool premium. Uh, I didn't get the you know, I didn't get the 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 you know, the, the grand wizard score, but I got like the number one position in the high score table. It was like, it wasn't, a, it wasn't in the, in the general scheme of pinball scores. It was 868 million. That's not a big deal. Right. So <laughs> sure enough, I, I said, I, I mentioned it in the, in the podcast that I did earlier in the week and, and just right as I'm waiting for, you know, as I'm waiting to go on to your show, I'm getting text messages from my guys going, Hey, I'm at like nine 35 and I, have <laughs> I was like, yeah, well, you know, with these guys and, and they say, well, you put the challenge out there. I was like, well, I, <laughs> it's just, oh man, you know, 
<laughs> yeah, Tim Sexton t- texting me. You know, I'm like, hey, I'm a nine hundred thousand. Like, oh, like, oh, <laughs> you're gonna blow through a billion. You know? Oh yeah. So, yeah. Dude, People think my Adams family has a reset problem. It's just that I own all the high scores on it right now. So, you know, you get about halfway into the game, the game just resets, you know. So, yeah. the high scores are safe. Yeah. <laughs> Brian's yes. in the background, Alexa, turn off the game. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I, I see. If I had that tonight, just as he was just as he was getting ready to knock me off, I would <laughs> See, this is another component you need in the spike yeah, system, yeah, right? Absolutely. Yeah, you gotta use your home automation <laughs> to kill games. You All right, let's move it. on to the next yep. segment. And here it comes. Back in '82, I used to be able to throw a pigskin a quarter mile. Back, back to the to cave, cave with with time runner. Why are things so heavy in the future? Is there a problem with the Earth's gravitational pull? Welcome, folks. We're heading back to 1975. That 1975? was uh, 44 years ago. Just a mere 44 years. <laughs> and uh, I only have two points to talk about until we get to what's in the juke. And we have a special 8-track edition coming up. So nice. it's going to be shorter. Ha <laughs> <laughs> ha. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I have I believe... prizes. I have new prizes. You do? Yeah. Okay. All the old um, prize, all the prizes from last week went out today. Oh, good. Yeah, except well, for one that we, because uh, second our... second place winner did not claim their prize, so okay. that prize is coming back. Awesome. Sorry, Sorry. my wife's leaving. Okay, yeah. so now we can get relaxed. All right. Um, Jaws was released in movie theaters in 1975. Oh. Around this time, it became the highest grossing movie of all time. Highest grossing movie of the year for a while, and uh, the first movie to earn one hundred million in the U.S. and Canadian box office. That is actually pretty amazing that they couldn't break a hundred million until then. Yeah. Uh, at this point, we would we would be having Jaws music playing, but um, I didn't tell Adam to cue it up. So, jo- uh, Adam, could you just hum a little bit of the Jaws theme? Oh, there it is. <laughs> One nice. step, I'm one step behind you, Mark. Keep, keep that going, and then I'll I'll go to the second point. The arcade news of 1975. Horror Games, real company, published its only game, Shark Jaws. Guess what? Intended to cash in on the popularity of Steven Spielberg's film Jaws. Uh, but what's funny about that one is sharks don't make any noise, and they couldn't use that music. So let's <laughs> listen in on the audio of somebody playing this game on YouTube. If, oh. if you will, sir. <clears throat> okay, so you, you want me to click on the link that you provided me? Yes, and hopefully there will be just a quick ad for Grammarly. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, that's the thing about these ads. You know, there, there is no ad. Here it comes. Oh, good. Yes. Oh, that listen to the, the clicking. Of... Listen to the clicking. Man, that... That's it. No, that sounds a, like a shark. That's, that's a sounds, shark coming at you. Sounds when like I'm so- out swimming and I hear that, I just I get out of the water. There's a guy in a scuba outfit, <laughs> and apparently he has a sonar, I guess, on his belt, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> oh, he oh. just got eaten. That's the eaten <laughs> sound. <laughs> yes, video games. <laughs> They're so awesome. <laughs> so, uh, I guess it's time, right, Mark? Time for... Time for that thing that we do called right. what's, what's it called? Chip. Is it over? Oh my! It is now. I've got three prizes for today. Okay, so okay. Uh, Mark, why don't you run us through the rules of the game and how uh, it's played and uh, what you uh, how we uh, tally things up. The rules of the game. Adam will play uh, just a few seconds of the song, and we will not tell you who the artist is and what what the title of the song is. But you, our listeners, will guess this. And the first one that is able to guess, uh, according to the way we view the uh, chat log on our side, uh, will be declared the winner. You can get uh, either a half point oh, or... Yeah. Yep. <laughs> I forgot to play the thing. Here you go. That sound like. <laughs> there you go. Or if you get both the title and the artist, you'll get a full point. Full point. That's correct. <laughs> but you will only be allowed to punch in the face and in the groin. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. So we have three prizes. 
Uh, I have another copy of the Ghostbusters remastered soundtrack with two extra tracks, including Disco Inferno and another version of the Ghostbusters, a little extended version. And uh, last week, someone didn't claim the E.T. prize set, so it's still out there. And here we have uh, the VHS uh, mock-up. That was like... The walking E.T. guy. Uh, and then I've it's in a added... Ziploc bag. Yeah. And then it's in it... this. It's in a Ziploc bag. Yeah. So this is the spaceship that yeah. uh, you can look inside and see scenes from the movie. And this is all second place, right? And then there's tiny little E.T. guys. They're like super small. And there's two of those guys. And then I've added today, mint in the package, an original E.T. figure by LJN. Uh, also a video game maker back in the day of crappy Nintendo games. Yes. So uh, those are second place. And then tonight, for the first place winner, uh, for guessing the most correct answers, uh, I have... Uh, what is a limited edition Walgreens exclusive of Mario and Donkey Kong figures? Very difficult to find. Uh, that is going to be the first place win tonight. So, all right, should we get this going? Oh my gosh, that's gigantic! Yes, let's get this going. We, the, <laughs> so this is a What's in the Juke eight track edition. There this, will be eight tr tracks. Okay, did I right. mess that up? Yeah. No, I did. You didn't. It sounds great. Okay, good. Should we okay. just switch between them midway through the song? Yes, the song will be in the middle, and uh, you can hear the other song in the distance going backwards. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you, should, you should, like, play the first 10 seconds of one song and the second 10 seconds of the next song. <laughs> Do you remember that? On 8-Tracks, you can hear, like, the like the other track like going yeah. backwards, and, the, yeah. and that was really annoying. Yeah, it was really annoying. <laughs> well, who came up with that? I don't know. George? It's, no. That's the worst. Yeah, the... Okay, here comes the first track. All right. Uh... <laughs> I love it. It's good. It was great. Come on. That's an easy one. <laughs> we should let George do it too. Okay, yeah, we can't let ahead. we can't let George cuz he's ahead of everybody. Okay, fine. Yeah. All right. Up, uh, Brian Frober. Brian Frober with a half point and not Dancing Queen Mr. Peabody, but close. Uh Andy Baldwin gets the hustle. Uh also, but that was after who is the artist? Anyone got the artist? Billy Seven. Oh, look at that. Billy welcome Seven. Welcome to the show, Billy. Yeah, welcome to the show. Uh, oh, I should play some sound clips. That's a half point, half point. for Brian Frober and a half point for half point. Billy Seven. Okay, here comes the next track. <laughs> what a hint. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I love this. this. I love going back in time. To bef these songs are so beloved by my. Uh, like I, I remember as a child listening to these. My parents listened to these. Yeah, uh, it's like Mike Page. Love will keep us together. Mike is on the board, and uh, Billy Seven uh, gets the artist again. That's Billy a seven. Is, is that right? <clears throat> yeah, that was right. Okay. Billy, Billy's got to learn that you do the you do either the artist or the song and then the other separately, so you, so you at least get, get the half point. Right, 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 right. <laughs> uh, he's he's got the right idea. If he can get them both in, though, he gets them. All right, so there's a half point, half point. for uh, Mike Page, and a half point for Billy Seven. Okay, here comes the next one. Oh, this one has a okay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> God, this song is so good. Yeah, Annie Baldwin's right in there with Sweet Emotion, followed by Mr. Peabody on the board again with Aerosmith. Both of those guys get a half point for Sweet Emotion by half point. Mr. Brian Jones does not get the credit for Aros Smith. Aros <laughs> Smith. Right. Okay, here comes the next one. You know, it's funny. We played <laughs> we played this as one of our intro songs, uh, oh, yeah. first season. Yeah, Magic Pilot. Who got that? Mike Page. 
Mike Page, all right. Pulling <laughs> pulling ahead, Mike Page. Mike Page with a full, full point. point. Here's the Magic. problem with this. Mike Page is from Canada, which makes things difficult for me. I'm going to have to start charging Canadians for shipping. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's like, I want to send a letter to Canada. It cost me 10 bucks. I'm not... <laughs> <laughs> Send it in like a paper bag and see what happens. Or <laughs> I can drive a giant wooden trailer across the border. See what somebody happens. beat Mike, so he can't win. All right, here we go. Uh, next, next track. <laughs> this is like one drum beat. There we go. <laughs> Brian Jones gets a full point for both the name and the artist. Jive Talking by the Bee Gees. Full point. All right, that's awesome. And then here comes the next track. <laughs> <laughs> I like how fast they're getting these, don't you? It it is it is interesting. I like how that song has like they make a mistake, but they just keep going. And yeah, like, whatever. It, yeah, it's it, back in the day. It's, that's it's it. always been like that, huh? Why can't we be friends? Oh. Greaseball is on the board. Oh my gosh! And he got so both. Many people. He got both of them. Full point. Yeah, full, full point. point. Nice. We are old. Wow. We know stuff. Brian Jones says, "We are old. We know stuff." <laughs> I want to play a so little the, more of that. The, the Davalo says it cost me ten bucks to send a letter to Canada too, and I'm already here. <laughs> <laughs> All right, here comes the next track. Uh, this is a good one. I love this. Yes. Song. This song is so well known. I don't know how anybody couldn't guess that. You know. Is it Megadeth? <laughs> no, it's not Megadeth. <laughs> <laughs> no. uh, should I play a little more? Sure. Singing the same, same old, old song. song. I know every crack in <laughs> these dirty sidewalks of Broadway. <laughs> <laughs> that song sucks. Change it. Well, we'll answer the, what it is, chat. Brian, and it'll People get changed. Don't like it. <laughs> Same old song. No. The name of the game. Rhinestone but, Comfort. It he is must... not Neil Diamond, <laughs> but it does sound like a Neil Diamond song. <laughs> I think we should give half a point to Billy Seven. Bill, Billy Seven's mm-hmm. close, yeah. Rhinestone, R- Rhinestone Comfort. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, He's moving fast. Right, okay, cowboy. Someone got cowboy in there. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Mr. Peabody on the board <laughs> with the correct name. And who's the artist? Come on. We still don't have an artist yet. That is. Everybody's Googling now. <laughs> I know. I. <laughs> George, what, what is it? Metallica. <laughs> uh, you really want me to say it? Yeah, go ahead. It's Glenn Campbell. Glenn Campbell. Half right. point. point. For the guest. All right, cool. And here's comes here's and here's comes. Here's comes the last track. The last track. All right, here we go. I changed it out, Mark. I had to we make have a two way tie for first right now. Do we really? Oh and we have a three way tie for second. Really? Okay, here we go. I might have to skip into the middle. Andy Baldwin, Pinball Wizard, Mr. Peabody, Elton John. Half point for each of them. Half point. Oh! So that, so that means Mr. Peabody pulled ahead to win with two points. Uh, Mike Page with 1.5 points. Dang it, that guy won the five. E.T. set. I got to send him E.T. 
DT, yes, sir. Why, Mr. Peabody is 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 in in Canada? No, uh, Mike Pages. Oh. So uh, he's he's winning all well, the ET stuff. Well, well, here's the problem. Um, well, yeah, Mike. Oh, that's true, Mike Page. Yeah, one point five. And then there's actually a four way tie for third place. Oh no! So we need to we, do something. We have to have a tiebreaker. All right, we'll we'll do a quick tiebreaker. Uh, this will be a more modern song. How's that? Okay, as long as it's not Taylor Swift, we're good. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Not quite that modern. Let's just fast forward to the 80s because somebody is going to lose, and this is what's going to happen to them. That's tough. <laughs> That's really tough. No wow. Greaseball, Shattered Dreams. Who's it by? Wow. Not Naked Eyes. Brian Jones, Shattered Dreams. Someone's going to get it. This is a tough one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't have picked that one. Maybe I should have done something a little simpler. Everyone's getting the name. Now everyone's Googling. <laughs> <laughs> go, go, go. Who's, uh, who, Naked Eyes was a good guess. That's not it, though. Uh, so he just tied a bunch of people up again? Johnny hates jazz. Andy Baldwin. Did he just win? No. Nope, now you've got a two-way tie. Now you have a two-way tie. Andy Baldwin and <laughs> Grease Ball. <laughs> really? That's correct. We're going to go to ten songs what? like we always do. Oh, man. All right. I'll pick an easier one. How about a really, really easy one? So the only two people, pe- pe- Grease Ball and Mike Page are the only two that can compete. We should may just make them no. guess a number. Well, no. Andy Baldwin. Oh, oh, I'm Andy, sorry. Andy this said, was, "Give it to Grease Ball." This is third p- third place, right? right? Andy third. said, "Give it, to, give it to Grease Ball." He won last week. Okay, sounds good. <sighs> Thanks Thank for you, playing, Andy. everybody. That was awesome. I was a that was a good game. That was a good game. Good game. We should get to the uh, interview. Oh well, wait, are there any? Uh, we do listener have listener call? calls today. Nice. I got a bunch actually. Uh, huh. I actually missed a couple calls from callers during the last six months but don't tell anybody uh what yeah i know i don't check the voicemail unless bob's there bob who's this bob (laughs) (laughs) oh you know bob hey okay radio podcasters (laughs) (laughs) all right so uh we'll check the voicemail here uh here we go thank you for calling 612-548 game this is arcade radio Please leave your message after the tone. Oh. All right. Hey, Arcade Radio. This is Aaron Sanders. Long-time listener, first-time caller, uh, and I have a question for George Gomez. Out of all the things that you've done in your career over the last 30-plus years in the coin-op industry, what's been your proudest achievement from an engineering standpoint? You know, was it the Tron joystick? Was it a, a toy that you made on one of the latest CERN games? Or or uh, what was it? So uh, interested to hear your answer, and uh, thank you for all your contributions to the coin-op industry. Cheers. Yeah, cool. That's a question for George. Wow, that's a, that's a tough one. I would guess, um, uh, you know, in terms of... As as the caller said, an engineering achievement. I would guess that um, I think Pinball 2000, um, you know, which was the uh, the you know I I got a patent on the coincidence between a virtual object and a real object, right? So we had it was um, you know, we used a um, we used a combining mirror to uh, make a video image appear like it was uh, standing on the play field of a pinball machine. And, Is that and like course, for Revenge of Mars? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Mars, right. And so, uh, so wherever, you know, wherever the image appeared, there would be sensors. And so when the ball crossed the plane of the sensors, we could transform the image, blow up the Martian, do whatever we want, make it get large, you know, do, do whatever. So I guess, you know, I, I think that project, um, that project was kind of like, you know, the company gave me the keys to the car and let me drive. And, and there was, it was a really, it was a, it was a big complicated um, effort, engineering and design effort. Uh, and so I would say 
that I'm I'm proud of that. Um, That's cool. I'm proud of what we pulled off, even though it became a platform that was <clears throat> not really viable. Um, it really had a lot of really cool design things. Like we got a ton of patents on things, and and there was a lot of a lot of really neat things. I I actually hadn't played Revenge of Mars until a couple of years ago at MGC, and uh, I have to say, uh, I think I was intimidated by the machine when I walked by it. I thought, why did they throw a video game in there? Uh, yeah. And I played it, and I was like, this is really fun. It is an awesome game. I, I don't know what you guys think, but I think it's really good. And, and it became, uh, you, you did a few games like that, right? We did uh, we did two. The second one I didn't care for um, so much. It was a Star Wars Episode One theme, right? And um, so the magic to that to that uh, thing that I came up with was the fact that I didn't want to see the edges of the CRT. Okay. Right. So it's like so I basically all of the stuff in Revenge from Mars is set on black. Sure. Because it really sells the illusion, right? Yeah. But the theme after me. Um, those guys basically ignored that and, and played. They had they, they were very enamored with the notion of episode one film clips. And okay. they ran the film clip full screen, which basically showed you that distinct CRT shape. And to yeah. me, that just broke the entire illusion. Yeah. Um, so I didn't really care for the Star Wars game, but, but I think we did a pretty good job with, with Revenge from Mars. I, I have one in my house and and... I'll tell you that that kids love it. I mean, it's the game in my house that kids go what? running up to and play. It doesn't matter. It's like they see the line of pinball machines, yeah. and if the one that's got a video game in it, that's the one they want to play. <laughs> it, it's a fun, goofy game. I mean, it's it's a good game, but it's also got a lot of goofy things in the Revenge from Mars theme, and it's just it's fun, the stuff that pops up on the screen, the concepts you came up with, and the whole presentation. Yeah, It's just a lot of fun. Cool. Are we at one we more have- call? Uh, we had great, we had we had a great time making it, um, oh, and cool. you know we had writing all those jokes and stuff. You know, yeah. it was really it was fun. What a great what a great uh, property that uh, the mar- that uh, that whole tops property. Uh, is you know, right. it's not the tops property though. Oh, it's not. No, it's like uh, the the top stuff was going on, um, maybe concurrently, and and they you know. We we basically all of that stuff is the brainchild of uh, Brian Eddy and Lyman Sheets. Oh, okay. uh, originally when they did Attack from Mars. Sure. Mm-hmm. And and when we were doing Pinball Two Thousand, um, they uh, you know they they the company mm-hmm. felt that hey the platform is so important that we we really need to show it off with um, a theme and a game that everyone. Um, you know, everyone would love. And, and so they said, you know, they said to me, you know, do a, do a reprise of uh, attack from Mars, call it revenge from Mars and, 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 you know, use, use every uh, ounce of power in the system. And then that's what we did. That's cool. But that <laughs> it, it is, yes, it's Martians come to earth and they do goofy things and, you know, they say funny stuff, but it's got nothing to do with the tops property. Okay. That's mm-hmm. cool. I didn't know that. Uh, all right, we have one more call. I think it's also from Aaron Sanders. I'll play that one real quick. Okay, here we go. Hey, Arcade Radio. Uh, our Aaron Sanders here, longtime listener, second time caller. <laughs> Had another question for George Gomez. Uh, as a design engineer myself, there's been several times you want to fall into the pit, the pit, you know, the standard pitfall of, wouldn't it be cool if X? You know, so I'm wondering, in in your time in the industry, what was a cool idea that you had for a game or, or pinball that just didn't quite make the cut because of cost or time constraints or other? Uh, thanks again. Yeah, there's wow, there's lots of stuff. I mean, that that stuff that uh, you know didn't really get realized in some way or another. I'm trying to think of something that that um might you know that spy hunter three you know <laughs> spy hunter right two. So, you know hey say hey, spy hunter two was done after i left the company oh uh, okay good. And I, and i'm really excused. sorry i'm really sorry <laughs> <laughs> i'm really sorry for it. i'm really sorry <laughs> i remember playing that at aladdin's castle and thinking i want my quarterback <laughs> yeah 
<laughs> they, you know, they, uh, I, I give them, um, you know, I give them one star for being ambitious. <laughs> but the, the, um, the, 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 clearly the hardware couldn't do what they wanted, what they thought they could do. <laughs> <laughs> right. Oh, my God. That's hilarious. So, so I don't know. I mean, caller, I'm sorry. I can't think of a thing that I can. I mean, I guess. Uh, well, I have to think about that. Maybe before the show's over, something will come to mind that's like significant that um i did it i'll tell you I'll, so i did i worked on a game called armed and dangerous um in which and and actually no this is a great story this will this will tie in to what you guys are doing what you guys have and stuff um so the linking of fast break came from a game called armed and dangerous that never saw the light of day so i was working on armed and dangerous and the idea was that you had two games linked together and you had tanks you had a, a play field with tanks on it on both games. And and the, the tanks in your game represented me, and the tanks in my game represented you. And I was trying to kill all the tanks before you kill all of my tanks. And um, sort of video game rules applied to a, a, a pinball scenario. And um, I, by the way, that's not the first time that was done. Um, you know, Steve Ritchie did it in, in with Hyperball. Um, back in uh, the early, you know, early 80s, um, um, and meaning uh, I shouldn't say the linking, but what he tried to do was apply video game rules to a pinball machine. Um, and so so I had a similar scenario, but mine were linked. Um, and um, I tried everything. I tried uh, to constantly give you the ball and use flippers to take out the tanks and uh, I tried, eventually I moved away from the flippers and I used a cannon that shot a, a one inch diameter um, nylon ball through the air inside the cabinet. And I created like about a billion ball traps. <laughs> I couldn't get, oh, wow. I couldn't reload the cannons. And, um, but the one thing that did survive is, and the company came down and they let me go to a place where we actually had it sort of working. And, uh, uh, but not quite there. And I, I felt like, you know, given time, we could do it. But they really looked at it and they said, OK, it's not a pinball machine. It's not a video game. We're not entirely sure what to do with it or how to sell it. But we know that if you started a pinball tomorrow, we could sell it. So I was like, OK, so now I've got a short schedule because I've burned all this time on <laughs> Armed and Dangerous. And uh, it occurs to me that. Um, you know, go get me a, a basketball, go get me an NBA license. I know exactly what to do. And I had right away, I, I sort of had in the back of my mind, always had the notion of a shot clock, working against a shot clock, a defender, uh, in addition to shots on basket. Um, and it was a natural to take the linking setup from fast break um, and put an NBA fast break and also change the scoring, which was very controversial. I think, I think, if you haven't heard the story, the company was really scared of the basketball scoring. And yet the basketball scoring is what makes linking work because you feel such pressure. The scores are together. It's a relatable number. So you know that, you know, I need a three. I need a two. I just need to beat his 26 or whatever it is that he's got. Right. Mm -hmm. And and uh, Tim Kitzrow, the announcer, you know, the, you know, who, who handled so much of Midway's amazing product over the years, um, you know, he did a great job of creating the tension and, and making fun of you and, and sort of <laughs> engaging the player uh, with the with the speech calls. And so uh, so the linking system from from Armed and Dangerous is what enabled linking in NBA Fast or NBA Fast Break. And we, we did, yeah, how, how primitive was it that we, we actually got a patent <laughs> on linking those pinball machines? How ridiculous is that? In the I love world it. We live in, you know, in the stuff that I spent all day working on today, right? We were talking about the connectivity and I'm like, wow, you know, it's like, imagine a day when I, you could actually get a patent on linking two games together. <laughs> <laughs> right. I, I own two NBA fast breaks. They are linked. I enjoyed buying the modem chips and the extra RAM chips. And uh, somebody like has the championship link artwork that goes across the top, so I yep. like it. It's in one piece. 
favorite game my wife and I play it like every Friday and Saturday night. Yeah, cool. it's it's I mean it's uh you know it in the there was a resurgence of those things uh a couple of years ago. Almost all the all the big barcades had a pair and every ah. time they had them there you'd walk into the place and there'd be a crowd of people if anybody yes. both games, right? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. So it interestingly enough back in the day when we released that game it was a ho hum it was like everybody was like yeah uh <laughs> can't believe it i mean it it just seems like a formula that could come back i mean and heck why sell one pinball machine when you could sell two or four or eight <laughs> yeah nice I, yep all right all right. Well, I think that's uh, that's really great. We had two calls, and that brings us to the highlighted part of this whole thing, which is <laughs> that's where we welcome the guest for the umpteenth time to the show. George Gomez is joining <laughs> us on the pl- on. On the podcast tonight, uh, very well respected in many of the, the prominent names in the business, Bally, Midway, uh, Williams, Stern. Uh, l- let's get started uh, right out of the shot. You started out with Bally Midway. Uh, how'd you get hired? Uh, how did that interview go? Yeah, so, um, you know, it was a different time, and... Um, so it was um, it was fall of uh, 1978, and I graduated from uh, you know I graduated from school in uh, May, that May, that you know that previous May blew off the summer, and um, you know my mother started uh, making noise about you know you got to get out of the house and get a job, <laughs> so <laughs> uh, I had uh, I had had a teacher that was instrumental in that he told me that I could go to work in um in a in a known design environment like a consulting firm or an in-house design uh you know design studio um and you know it'd be fine i'd be you know i'd be working um but he said you know um you another option is to go to work at a place where you know they need you but they don't know they need you Um, they don't know what you do, but you know that from looking at their stuff that they need you. So I, I had been playing at school. I'd been playing games, uh, in the arcade. Now you have to put this in the context of the, you know, the seventies, right? The late seventies. And, you know, in 1977 arcades were pretty, you know, arcade games were pretty primitive. Right. So, Mm -hmm. um, I, uh, had been playing a game and I looked up at the marquee. And in with this guy's, you know, with this guy's uh, advice in the back of my head, and uh, and I realized that wow, man, this thing is is really it's bad. It's <laughs> it, you know, it's it's uh, it's pretty bad. And I looked up and it said Midway Games, Franklin Park, Illinois. And I thought, <laughs> I you know, I thought, hey, I don't even have to move. <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, I got. I actually got the interview through a uh, through a recruiter that you know kind of cold called. You know, I went in there and I said, "I want you call these guys and etc." And um, and I called. I talked to a HR guy and he said, "Well, the guy you got to talk to is traveling. It's a couple of weeks away." And he gave me an appointment. And in the meantime, I I kind of took I took a Polaroid camera. Remember those? Mm. You know? <laughs> And uh, ran around the city and photographed a bunch of Midway stuff. And, and, you know, back then a designer interviewed with a portfolio, which was basically a, like a giant book of your renderings and pictures of, of models you built and all this kind of stuff, right? And, um, and so I, not knowing, out of total ignorance, not knowing where the responsibility started and stopped, I sort of redesigned everything. So I, you know, I... I did, I did images of, you know, I did, I did sketches for what should happen on screen and I did art for the cabinets and I did the cabinets and the controls and all this stuff. And when I walked in, um, they started sending guys from engineering would come through and they looked through my book, flip pages, pages, pages. The last guy came in and he looked and he says, you know, 300 bucks a week. When can you start? 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> but that, that being that being said, uh, the very first, you know, my very first, uh, you know, so I walk in the door like it's fall of '84, and and I was really kind of a, uh, it, I was a strange, you know, just a strange guy in this place because it was all engineers. Um, so they had, you know, they had mechanical engineers, they had electrical engineers, they had software engineers, and then they had artists. And, and I was kind of like, you know, you know, an, an industrial designer is kind of like a cross between uh, an engineer and an artist, right? Yeah, it's, sure. it's a guy, that, you know, he deals with how humans interact with objects. That's what he designs. And hmm. so, um, so, you know, at, at first, uh, I think a lot of people wanted to kill me because, you know, <laughs> like a guy would work, guy would work on a thing and he'd say, you know, it was all like, like these blocky tanks and stuff. And they, then they were like, this is a tank. And I'd say, no, that's not a tank. You know, and I, I, you know, knock out a sketch of here, this is a tank. <laughs> and, and, you know, they were like, that's voodoo. That's <laughs> not know? a knife. That's a knife. <laughs> so, yeah. So that's, that's voodoo. So, um, but eventually there was a guy, um, there was a guy who was trying to find a voice inside Midway and Midway at the time was, was doing really well with licenses and, and really the internal engineering teams of which I was a part of our entire existence was about, uh, either making, uh, Japanese licenses, uh, producible in the United States, like things like, you know, they were. Like the day I walked in the door, they were making Taito Space Invaders, um, you know, for, for, you know, and it was the Midway version, you know, and, you know, you know, the story of, you know, that's how Pac-Man happened. That's how, a lot of those Japanese licenses at the time. Uh, it was more convenient to build the games in the States because, you know, you got this giant arcade cabinet. And so the Japanese would either send over just board sets um, and we would install them and, you know, we would build everything else. So the internal engineering team was was almost a, a, a production engineering team. The company did have two R and D, um, you know, like design studios. One was Dave Nutting and Associates, um, and the other one was Arcade Engineering. You know, and Arcade did Arcade did uh, Ronnie Halberton's group. They did um, they did Omega Race, which you were talking about earlier. Uh, and then of course uh, Dave Nutting. You know, Dave Nutting did Wizard of War. They they, they did Gorf. Um, and they were, uh, and I mean, actually Dave Nutting is an industrial designer by trade. I just didn't, when I walked in the door, I, he was, they, they had an, they had a studio offsite and, uh, and you know, they were, and they were definitely the Kings, you know, they were the Kings within midway of stuff that, that was actually internally designed was either coming from Ronnie Halliburton's group and, in, in um, in Fort Lauderdale or, or from arcade engineering in, uh, I'm sorry, or from DNA in uh, Arlington Heights. So, um, so my, my rise or my, my lucky break, if you will, was, um, there was a, a young programmer, a uh, guy named Bill Adams, who, um, also wanted to make games. Uh, and there was a young hardware engineer, Atish Ghosh, uh, who, uh, also wanted to make games. And, and the three of us really, um, you know, were the designers of things like Tron. Um, and so when the Tron, you know, we did, uh, we, the very first thing we did was Satan's Hollow. Um, Atish designed the, what we call the double line buffer, uh, MCR2 system, which you guys are familiar with because you've probably repaired tons of MCR2s. Uh, <laughs> MCR means uh, Midway Card Rack 2. Um, and so, um, so Atish had designed the system and, and Bill wanted was dying to program it, and uh, you know I I filled in a lot of the art blanks and and you know made controls and cabinets and came up with ideas and storyboarded stuff and tried to make things, uh, you know, cool and and so uh, uh, you know that was the rise uh, when we we did Satan's Hollow we didn't have great success with it you know it was like kind of like a, eh that's okay. Um, um, I, I personally designed all those bird patterns, you know, all those flight patterns for the birds mm -hmm. in, in Satan's Hall. Um, and, um, but the company, you know, the, the company was willing to listen. So when, 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 the, 
the, the licensing guys, actually it was a guy named uh, Tom Neiman, who was the licensing guy at Bally. And, and Midway at the time was a Bally company. They were owned by Bally. And Tom Neiman brought back the Tron license. And he said, hey, there's these guys making a movie about video games and we need, you know, we need to make, you know, we really need to do this because, you know, it'll be, it'll be amazing. We'll, you know, we, we need to do the game in time with the launch of the movie, et cetera. It's a movie about video games. So he brought back the scripts and, and we begged, we literally begged management to give us a shot at it because <laughs> management's idea had been that the two, um, you know, slick R and D groups, DNA and arcade engineering, uh, were going to uh, do a little bit of a playoff and determine who was going to do the, the Tron product. And, uh, so we begged to be thrown into the competition. And um, so we went to work um, and, and we like, you know, I generated all this stuff, right? Uh, my storyboards for Tron are in the, the Strong Museum in uh, Rochester, New York, the Strong Museum of Play. And they've got them all. Um, they've, they've, got, um, they've got a bunch of stuff, but uh, um, from, from the Tron product. Um, so they um so we did we did the stuff and we went to the like the day when they were going the company was going to decide who was going to do what and and i think that we got really lucky because because um both uh dave nutting whom i have huge respect for and ron halliburton who i also have a lot of respect for uh those guys were just very established and they didn't think they need to bring anything to the playoff except the conversation and that's what they brought they brought a conversation and some arm waving and, and we actually had brought stuff, you know, so we had, you know, we had, uh, you know, we, and we had a plan. We had a, a plan, which was, hey, these are the waves and we're going to do it on MCR2. So we're not inventing any new hardware. We're using a hardware set that we just used on, on Satan's Hollow. Mm. We know exactly what we're doing with this. And, and, you know, I had the storyboards that, you know, this is what the light cycle is going to look like. This is what the, this is going to look like, et cetera. And, and all that stuff, by the way, all that stuff changed as we got into the design, you know, the, you know, stuff got probably the one that survived most pristinely was the light cycles, everything else. If you look at my original storyboard, you can see the connection, but there, but there's definitely like visible differences. I wish I had that stuff here. If I had known we were going to be doing this, I would have <laughs> sent you some images so you could, you know, somehow uh, see them. But, well, maybe uh, we, I, I think. I mean, somebody somebody was talking about some discs of Tron artwork that just recently sold. Oh. Yeah, that so that was the um, that was the cabinet art. Those were the those were the um, um, yeah that was uh, Tony Ramuni um, ah. did the cabinet art, and uh, that piece that everybody's talking about was the there was a color sketch that would be sent to the um, <clears throat> to the silk screening uh, facility, you know, which was at the time was Link Smith Manufacturing. And Link Smith would uh, have this, and it would show them the order of the silk screens. And that's that's actually, if you look at that sketch, if you get a chance to look at that sketch, you'll see the the colors, and they have a number next oh. to the color. And that that what that number is that screen number one is this color. Screen number two is this color. Oh my gosh! And, and then they had the and then they had his color sketch right there to reference it, so that when they got all done, if it looks like the color sketch, I mean. Think about think about that. Think about how primitive all that stuff was, um, you know, in comparison to how we do it now, where you know we send a digital piece of art to you know to a digital printer, and 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 um, you know uh, the rest is 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 easy. Um, so um, yes, yeah, so, you know, we went to the we went to the playoffs with uh, you know, and and the and I think that I think the executive team said, you know what, these young guys, uh, let's give them a shot and. And so we, we were off and running. And then it was then it was uh, some craziness because back in those days, uh, like, you know, spy like even even later in Spy Hunter days, you know, it was it was, it was uh, me and Tom Leon and it was they're really small teams. Right. And in Tron, because of the pressure of having to, you know, we had to have the at the time, Bally owned Aladdin's Castle, the art, the art you know, the Aladdin's Castle arcade chain, right? And they were going to do a competition, which was going to culminate in a playoff in Madison Square Garden. We were going to have 30 oh. Tron games, which we did. It was awesome. I went, you know, we went to the, 
uh, Madison oh. Square Garden, all these kids from all over the country played off, and and the, and you know they won a Tron and some oh my money. Oh god, that'd be and we so went fun. To the, we went to the uh, premiere of the movie, right? I have like in my, in my stuff, <laughs> oh man, uh, man, I have like the uh, I have the the stuff signed by the you know all the actors and everything. I'm... So uh, we had lunch at Tavern on Green in New York, and then went to the premiere, watched Tron. That is um, so cool, and, and you know. Did the, the actually? I, I think we we did the playoffs, and then we did, and then at the culmination was lunch, and then and then the uh, the, the what went to the premiere, the opening premiere of the movie, but um, so the pressure to have that meant that we had to have trons at every Aladdin's castle in the in the country, of which there were a lot, in anticipation, so that you know, so that each Aladdin's castle could run the tournament locate the local kid and then move him up into the finals right wow so you know it was so it's like this magic this incredible orchestration you know so, it's really interesting Martin, uh can i interrupt just for a second yeah, because yeah, yeah. uh uh there i have uh i run i i started the aladdin's castle group on facebook so if you okay. go to that there's a bunch of uh, pictures of Aladdin's castle, and one of the things that we repost often, or I see reposted often in in there, is the ads for that thing you're talking about. Uh, oh, the, really? The Tron yeah. competition. The Tron competition, yeah, for sure. It yeah. is so cool. I deal. like, and um, having had, I'm on my third Tron restore, which is inadvertently mm-hmm. how I ended up getting connected with you on Facebook. I accidentally. Uh, chatters i accidentally friended george when he showed up in a list of people and, and the person above him was the person i was going to friend and george was below him and i clicked on him and i'm like ah oh, crap i don't know george but george I know is gonna him. think you're a weirdo <laughs> i know i'm like uh i accidentally no, Chuck, friended I, you I, uh I but several uh, thousand i have several thousand facebook friends i actually know 100 people oh. <laughs> and i was like i actually do know who you are and here's why. Uh, but anyway, uh, go on with your story. I just, if, as an well, aside. Yeah, so, so, um, so, so one of the, one of the brilliant things that, that Bill Adams did was um, he, he decided that, and, and, and this was unheard of in those days. Um, he was going to have a programmer work on each wave and he was going to, masterfully integrate he was going to take one wave himself and then he was going to masterfully integrate uh all the all the waves to deliver the final game and and we and we pulled it off the only thing that we didn't pull off was what became discs of tron was actually designed for the original game there were originally five waves in the original game and discs of tron was one of them and and the problem that we ran into was discs of tron proved to be a substantial uh, load on the hardware, and so we just didn't have the resources in the in the in the hardware to do all the waves and Distatron. Um, Distatron ended up using every bit of MCR2 in order to in, in order to, uh, when we finally got to it. Um, but so at the eleventh hour, you know, we uh, actually it wasn't the eleventh hour. It was it was early on in the process. We killed it. We said, you know what? It'll be the sequel. And we pulled it out and we focused. And we, that, that was an intelligent decision that we made. Side uh, question. Early. Side question. Uh, is it true that you shortened the number of initials that you could put into the high score to save on memory? You know, I don't recall that, but it wouldn't surprise me because we were so tight. Yeah. Um, it wouldn't surprise me at all. I mean, we, we were, you know, we were... Um, we were taking advantage of every, everything we could. I mean, we had a run length encoding, uh, scheme, uh, you know, that we had, we had every, everything was, uh, back in those days. So MCR two was, I don't know, I don't know how familiar you guys are with it, but so the, the foreground is, um, by design 32 by 32 pixel picture blocks. And those pixel, you know, we stacked a couple of them to create, to make Tron. And, um, and, and then you can move a lot of them. Uh, and, and I believe, uh, uh, you know, 16 colors and you can, you can move all of them. You can move a lot of, a lot of things. The background was half the resolution. So 16 by 16 picture blocks, they were intended to be pages 
as that you that were fairly static you you, you brought them in uh only as needed and and you and you couldn't really move them uh, realistically you couldn't do much with them and again mm-hmm. same i remember i used to kids uh, a tea shot all the time and, you know he walk into my office to go i am going to get you 4096 colors and i'd say <laughs> Wow. wow, that's amazing. What am I going to do with that? And he goes, uh, well, uh, I don't know. You can put, you know, Johnny Carson's face on TV. And I'm like, I'm like, and then the reality would hit. And he would say, oh, yeah, you, you get to select from 4,096. You really get 16. Oh. <laughs> like, what are you talking you know, Dude, what are you talking about? He said, well, yeah, you could have any, any shade. <laughs> you can have pink. <laughs> You can have skin color. You can have. <laughs> what am I going to do with this? <laughs> so, <laughs> That's yeah. funny. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's uh, so so Tron, you know, that we we did. Um, I spent a lot of time in uh, some of those, you know, one of those cabinets in Flynn's Arcade uh, in the film is a ca- is was my original prototype cabinet um, for the game. And I, I, maybe it was the Space Paranoids camera. I can't remember. I, yeah. I have to go back and look at the film. I think it is. But yeah. Is it? Yeah. So, so, um, and then you know, I think you were you were talking before we went on air. You were talking about the joystick and stuff. Yeah. Like that. So I was going to ask you about it. Could, could you tell yeah. us uh, that story? So, so how that came about? Is uh, what what happened is the the actual concept of the joyst of of a joystick that ref- that looked like a fighter pilot, you know, fighter plane joystick was actually a Dave Nutting concept. Dave Nutting was fooling around with a he had he had gotten a model of a of an F4 Phantom joystick. And mm-hmm. um, and he had literally I don't know where he found this thing, but he found uh, an F4 Phantom joystick and he was messing around with a really slick uh, sensing uh, technology where he had strain gauges attached to a nylon rod and <laughs> as you as you move the joystick and flex the rod that's cool um the strain gauges would react to the transition you know the material change in in, the, in and and sense and that would give you like omnidirectional control right with the strain gauges and it was a really slick thing but they, we couldn't ever get it quite working but so my boss said to me we're going to do a version of Nutting's joystick, but we need to mold something. And it can't look like an F4 Phantom joystick because, you know, the F4 Phantom joystick was designed with, you know, to be a lot more than what we needed. And, and so he said, why don't you style something? And, and uh, you know, and it was for Gorf. And so, so it was the Gorf, it was the black Gorf stick. And I, and I, so I sculpted that and made, made all the drawings, got all the injection molding stuff done and, and, and made the part. I, I cut my hand, uh, uh, I have night, I have a, a nice scar with, for nine, with nine stitches right here in the palm of my hand. Oh, where wow. I, I was, um, I was carving the flash off of one of my castings for the joystick and I buried an exacto knife right into this portion of my hand. <laughs> So, and to this day, I mean, you, you guys can't see it, but it's right there. <laughs> so, um, so anyway, uh, so long story short, um, when we were doing the Tron product right away, uh, they had sent us behind, besides the scripts, they had also sent us some of their development stuff. And I could see that they were, they had this glowing stuff, um, and, and, uh, and you know, everything was glowing. And so I, so right away I started thinking about how do I make my stuff glow? And, uh, and so I had, I asked, um, I had actually, we were having trouble with a switch inside the Gorf joystick. And I had asked, um, I had asked the molder because, you know, we, we didn't have CAD, we didn't have any of the, any of the stuff that we have today. And so I'd asked the molder to uh, mold me a, 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 a crystal clear plastic version just so that I could actuate it with my hand and see what was going on with the switch inside the joystick. So I had this thing sitting on my desk, the clear plastic one, months after we got done with solving the switch problem on Gorf. And I had this thing sitting on my desk 
and I had been playing around with a black light to make stuff glow in the cabinet. And, uh, and I got, I was leaving the office late one night and I turned off the lights to my office and had forgotten to turn off the black light. And I, I was, as I was closing the door, all the lights in my office were black. You know, my entire office was dark except for this glowing joystick sitting on my drawing table. <laughs> and it was, it was because it was because the plastic Strain. happened to have, you know, happened to have part of the material. The plastic had, you know, was excited by the, by the, by the black light. There you go. And so, Ugh. so, so then, so, so I, 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 I literally turned right back around, turned the lights back on and went to this thing and started messing around with it. And, and then I had it. I, so then I started messing around with where do I put the black light so I can light the joystick. Um, and so then I call the, I call the vendor. The Oops. Sorry, that's totally I, at my fault. I, I call the, I, you know, I call the vendor the next day and I say to him, I say to him, Hey, so, um, you know, what, what, what material did you make this out of? And he said, Oh, it's just, uh, it's just high impact styrene. And I said, well, that's never going to work. So because high impact styrene is very brittle. It's what your, it's what your kit models are made out of, right? Oh, okay. It's like when you buy a, an airplane model. That's what it. That's what high impact styrene is. It's not. It's not particularly durable enough for the arcades. So, I said, "Well, what what can I make this out of?" And he said, "Well, you make it out of polycarbonate." And I said, "Well, okay. Well, will it will it glow?" And he said, "Well, I don't know. Well, let's try it." So he made it out of polycarbonate. <laughs> Guess what? Polycarbonate didn't didn't glow. Didn't oh. glow like the styrene. So so then I said to him, "I said, well." Well, it doesn't glow like the styrene. He says, "Oh yeah, because the styrene was an indoor grade of styrene." And the reason it glowed is it had no UV inhibitors. But typically, all plastics, especially today, almost every piece of plastics has UV inhibitors put into it because it because otherwise the sun, you know, exposure to light destroys them, right? Right. And and so, so I said to him, I said, well, can we make a can we formulate can we get a formulation of a polycarbonate without the UV inhibitors? And can we also make it blue? To, in order to help, you know, color it light blue so that it help it on uh, the whole thing. So we fool around, fool around, and, and at some point in time, we managed to get a version that had uh, a minimal amount of UV inhibitors. As a matter of fact, probably not a lot, and it's why that's why all your Tron uh, joysticks have disintegrated over the years <laughs> mm. <laughs> because I took <laughs> out the UV inhibitors in order to make them glow. They're instead of there. a light blue now, they're more of a blue green aqua. Yeah. Yeah. And they probably have UV inhibitors. They probably don't glow as nice as my original ones. I don't yeah. know. Yeah. Do they glow as nice <clears throat> as my original ones? They so the all tell. the all the UV products actually lose it over time. <gasps> uh, anyways, oh, but no. one of the things. So I so it's kind of funny, George, because one of the things that I have been playing around with is I built a little LED board with UV LEDs that fits inside the joystick. Sure. Yeah. And so it mounts in there, and then we're we're in the process of working on a um, a little board that interfaces with the cabinet, so it can actually do different things. If you turn the spinner, it yeah. can make the lights rotate and stuff like that. Uh, I mean, and in part because I thought you have this joystick, and in some of the more modern ones, it doesn't glow quite as much as like yeah. I remember it glowing. So I thought, all right, let's give this some kick. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's I mean, and there you have the story of Tron joystick. Oh, it's so cool. <laughs> All right, so I have, an, I have a question. Uh, you went through the whole ballet thing. Uh, yeah. Can you take us on a trip of your employment? There's a second part to this question. Um, okay. Because, right. so, yeah, I mean, so you're, you're going to go through your, your LinkedIn right now, but uh, I also, <laughs> also kind of want to know, uh, what, when you were transitioning from competitor companies, just keep this in mind, when you were yeah. transitioning from competitor companies, to another prominent company in the industry. What was that yep. like? So give us a little of your background, uh, the different industry, the different uh, companies you worked for in the industry, and what it was like to, uh, to switch from uh, competitor to competitor. Right. So, um, yeah, so I went, you know, I, like I said uh, earlier, I, I graduated from school in May, and I took summer off in, in um, fall of, 1978 midway 
Games hires me, and I work at Midway Games. I think it was roughly about seven years, something like that. You know, in that time, the the big the uh, the big games that you know are that that I had a hand in. I worked on a lot of stuff, by the way. I mean, I did some of the. I mean, I did um, I did uh, a little bit of work on on that on some of the production stuff for that Omega race that that you're working on. Um, and if you look at the the art in the in um in the on the control panel there with the knobs and stuff, uh, I did all that art. That's oh, <laughs> cool. That's awesome. Um. Uh. So so anyway. Uh. So we um. So I in 1984 with the video game crash. Um, I find that the company has been shrinking. The company, you know, it, it, the company had gone from mass producing something like 1,100 games a day to 100 games a day. Oh, okay, yeah, they have wrap, yeah, put that, you know, think about that. So 1,100 arcade games a day, right? Like cabinets just rolling out. Um, the the factory was pretty amazing. The we would there would be a. a you know, there would be a half a mile of semis with raw material coming into the factory and a half a mile of semis with finished products leaving on another street to the point where uh, Franklin Park, um, Franklin Park um, government had to, the, the city of Franklin Park where Midway was located, had to make special arrangements with traffic in order to get all the, 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 the trucks coming in out of Midway wow. because we were snarling. Uh, all the traffic all over, you know, over a couple of busy streets in, in, in the city. But um, so um, in 84, uh, video game business is tanking. Midway's compressing. We're having we're going through layoffs. Everybody's I'm having to lay people off. You know, you know, the first set of layoffs isn't, you know, it's basically maybe you get rid of some people that, you know, you know, weren't that impactful, but the, the, the project managers fire those guys. But the second, the second wave and the third wave, you now you're really now you're beginning oh. to important people, right? So, right. so I I remember that uh, there was another one coming up, and I I don't know why I just I I said you know enough of this. I think this video game thing is over, and I'm 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 going to get out. So I had been involved in helping uh, Marvin Glass and Associates, which was a big uh, the the largest independent. Uh, uh, toy invention consulting firm in the world, and and they were here in Chicago, and I've been involved in helping them. They were they had a relationship with Midway, and they had they did games like Domino Man, Tapper, Journey, right. So, but before they got to that point, they used to come in with concepts like storyboard concepts, and management said, you know what, we can't tell if a game is fun from a storyboard concept. So if you guys are serious about developing games, then you have to develop the entire game, just like we do. Um, because the reality is that there are so many decisions that design teams make uh, to make something fun at the end of the process that, that unless you do that and you go through it, you can't, you know, nothing can happen. So, so they, we said, we have a relationship, all the, we will publish all the games, we'll manufacture all the games, we will give you our hardware. We'll teach you how to wear, work on our hardware, et cetera. So I had been involved in, in going down there into the city. Into the, they were downtown Chicago. I had been involved in going there to help them uh, get set up and understand how our art systems worked and all that stuff, right? And so I had a relationship with them, and I knew uh, one of the partners in the firm. So in 1980, Flash, you know, now we're past that. We've, we're past journey. We're past all that stuff. The, the business is tanking. Marvin Glass and Associates is saying, yeah, you know what? Um, we're going back to what we do, which is toys. And so one night I'm sitting in my office and it, I don't know why it came out of the blue. I said, you know what? It would kind of be fun to be a toy inventor. So I <laughs> call this guy, Howard Morrison is his name. He's, uh, he's the father of, along with Ralph Bear, the father of Simon, oh, the game wow. that you know, the tabletop game. Yeah. Right? And I call Ralph, I call, I call, uh, I call Howard Morrison and I say, uh, Howard, I think I want to be a toy inventor. And he said, well, your timing's good because we're going back to focus on toys and we're getting completely out of the video game thing. So he said, you come in with portfolio and we, and we like you, we'll, you know, we'll see what happens. And so, so I went down there, I interviewed and they gave me a job. 
and I was a toy inventor for about five years of my career, coming up with stuff that got licensed to all the major toy companies because they, they, they were an invention house. So all they did was invent a concept, pitch it. If a toy company liked it, they would license it from them. And then it was a really cool job because, like, you worked alone and nobody told you what to do or what to work on. So you went to work every day, you did whatever you wanted. So it's like, you know, today you're working on a truck and tomorrow you're working on Barbie's fashion runway. The after that, you're working on an outdoor water toy. It didn't matter. You could make anything you wanted as long as you were productive. They didn't really care. Wow. So it was it was an awesome place for somebody. If you're self motivated, you could and you could work in that in, in the constraints of no one telling you what to do. Um, which some guys, you know, some guys are very talented, but they can't be in that environment, you know. So the place had a huge revolving door. And but it was I consider it my graduate school because those people I learned so much. I had to come up with so much stuff. It's just such a numbers game. And they didn't they didn't sell anything with a drawing. They didn't everything we pitched had to be we had to make. So I became, you know, very self-sufficient at making whatever it is that I was pitching. It was a really good thing for me. So uh, um, anyway, so after Marv, I was at Marvin Glass for about five years, the firm broke up, partners got into a dispute, took the firm out. And um, I then I was on my own for a little while. I did some things. Uh, I, I was pitching different concepts to people. Um, and then I got I started getting work from a company called Grand Products, which was run by a guy named Dave Morofsky, who was the president of Midway all the years that I was uh there um, at Midway and Grand Products was trying to be a player in um, in the coin op business um, and so I uh, I started um, helping them do things like they they were they eventually became a contract manufacturer but I did I did um, like novelty games I did I did a game called Hawk Avenger have you ever seen that the helicopter you know the you remember the old Whirlybird helicopter games so I did a game called Hawk oh. Avenger. Look that up on, you know, look that up online for a company called Bromley. I did a bunch of things, and during that time, I, um, you know, I did the I did the American version of the virtual racing uh, uh, upright cabinet. So I was doing all kinds of weird stuff, ah. just whatever came my way. I did uh, some of the BattleTech stuff. You remember BattleTech? Yeah. Oh yeah. I did, uh, <laughs> we played that a lot. A small piece of the interiors and the original pods oh. in conjunction with the guys at uh, Incredible Technologies. You oh, know? cool. Yes, they, they travel around. I got to play in one of those uh, a couple of years ago at a convention. Okay. Uh, 2D so, Con I mean, had them. Yeah. So so in, during that time, I was pitching, you know, I was pitching ideas to whoever would listen. And I used to show stuff to uh, to Williams. Uh, all the time. Williams had by then in 1988, Williams acquired the Midway and Bally brands. Oh, okay. Okay. And so it became, you know, Williams Bally Midway. Mm -hmm. And so they decided, uh, so I would pitch stuff to them. And while I was pitching stuff to them, they basically offered me a job and I took it. And initially my, I was, I wasn't hired to make pinball machines. I was hired to, to do novelty games. And, uh, so I went to work there and, you know, it was it was 1993, you know, the the height of the strength, you know, the powerhouse that Midway was. Right. And so I and I knew a lot of those guys, you know, I mean, I knew, you know, I, I knew um, who they all were because we were all in Chicago, you know. And so so this um, this kind of I, this kind of explains something to me. I interject something here. Uh, PlayStation was released in 94. Uh, yeah. And. Along with that platform came a, a, a bunch of classic arcade uh, titles. And I was yep. always wondering how the Williams Midway classics all got, sort of got lumped together. And then now you have interviews with, you know, uh, Eugene Jarvis yeah. and, and Ed Rodberg. Eventually, and all the, even Atari stuff. Yeah, know, and I was just going to say, and Ed Rodberg and all yeah. these guys, right? So, yeah, so you were but, part, you were, you were actually. I guess I didn't really know this, but uh, when Williams acquired, acquired all this stuff, I mean, this all this is coming to a head uh, in, in, yeah. in, in different ways. You know, I mean, you know, midway in that time frame, uh, Bally Williams, uh, mid, you know, Williams, Bally, Midway in that time frame was we were the kings. I mean, we owned pinball. Owned, yeah. I mean, you know, 
you know, that was, it was, th that time was, you know, it was, it was NBA Jam, NFL Blitz, Mortal Kombat, you know, I mean, it was just it, it, on and on and on, right? So, um, and I got, you know, I got, I got to know and become friends with all those guys, you know, so I, I, I mean, all of those guys are, are my friends now. And, and, you know, I, I knew, you know, I knew of them before I went there and then became friends with them when we were there. Uh, I worked for many years. I worked with Mark Trammell of NFL, uh, NBA Jam and NFL Blitz fame. Um, and we were partners. We, we, we did a, you know, we did an Xbox PlayStation uh, game called NBA Ballers. Um, and we did that for a long time, you know, eight or nine years of our lives. <laughs> so, oh, wow. um, so yeah, so, so, uh, eventually after I was at Williams for about a year, not even six months, maybe. And, and Capcom had come to town to, to become a pinball company and they had stolen some guys from, mid, from, uh, Williams and Williams had a hole for, you know, a pinball designer. And they said, you know, you think you can do this? And I, and I raised my hand and said, yeah, absolutely. And, and that, and that's really was how I started designing pinball, um, pinball machines. I, up until that point in time, I had, um, I had never done a pinball. I'd done a lot of other things. I'd done novelty games. I'd done toys. I'd done arcade coin op video games, but I had never done, uh, pinball. And, and so, uh, um, yeah. And so I was there until they, you know, until, until they closed the doors in 99 mm -hmm. and then, um, and then Mark Trammell offered me a job at Midway again, working on PlayStation and Xbox stuff. And, and I did that for a long time. And during that time, uh, Gary Stern had reached out to me and said, you know, do you want to design, uh, games on the side for me, pinball games on the side for me? because he knew of me because I had competed with them, you know, when, when I was a, a Williams designer. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so I, I went and talked to my bosses in Midway and they said, yeah, you know, it's, it's not a, you know, pinball is not really a conflict of interest for what we're doing at that point. They had gotten out of the arcades and were focused, very focused on the consoles. Mm. And so, um, so I, I started doing a game, uh, you know, whenever I could for Gary as a consultant on the outside and um and i did that for many you know for many years i did a bunch of pinballs during that time can you give us Garrett. some of the names yeah i did lord of the rings during that time i did the sopranos right. i did uh, i'm trying to think i did batman the dark knight during that time awesome. uh, playboy um trying to think what else now uh, is there more than one playboy yeah there are three of them okay so... mine was the last mine was the last one and that that would have been like 2000 it would have been the first game that i did for them and half did half get one of those yes he did he had all three of them in his game room <laughs> <laughs> good to know and i did good get to know. To, i did get to go to them i did get to go to the one of the mansion parties and i saw the game i saw the game room with all the games and stuff he had by the way he had pristine arcades right he had a brand new pack you know brand new pac-man brand new donkey kong brand new that had been bought brand new so they had only ever been in his house wow nice so he had a really nice game room um cool in in um, um so it, uh, uh yeah and it was it was in it the, the game room was really it was an independent it would have been anybody else's house except for the fact that the man owned a mansion. Right. <laughs> so, uh, and it was on the grounds, uh, you know, at, at, at the, at the mansion in Holmes, uh, Holmesby Hills, um, you know, in, uh, in LA. And, uh, it was, it was, it was cool. It was, it was fun. Um, so, uh, so then, uh, let's see. So Midway, I was at Midway until they closed in 08. And, uh, and then I was with, uh, our friends, my friends at incredible technologies for about a year and a half, something like that, uh, tried to work on slot machines, slot machines. And I, you know, I spent a lifetime making interactive stuff. <laughs> um, I was kind of bored. Um, and so, uh, so it was during that time that, uh, Gary Stern called me up and said, uh, Hey, um, you know, our business is taking off again and we, we w really want to build something. And so I went to work for them and I've been in, in that role ever since. I'm, I'm the chief creative officer for the company. Um, all of the company's product development efforts are my responsibility. And I, I, 
I do get to keep my fingers in design and design things from time to time. I did Deadpool. I did this little Star Wars game. Um, <laughs> and right now I'm, I'm very focused on, on um, uh, uh, connectivity. So, cool. I mean, that's the, that's the arc of my career, if you will. <laughs> wow. <laughs> that's pretty awesome, actually. Oof, pretty amazing. And uh, what do you get? Guys- Go ahead. Brian. I'm very, very, very lucky that I've I've gotten to uh, spend my entire career making things that no one needs, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> no one needs wants. and everybody wants. Yeah, yeah, no one needs, everyone wants. Um, yeah, very, very fortunate. Very, very fortunate. Uh, well, I, uh, I, you know, no, normally we wrap up around this time, but if you have a few more minutes, I think uh, I think we got a few more questions for you. Sure, let's do it. Okay. Uh, Brian, Mark, you want to kick it off? Yeah, you know, I'm I'm kind of curious. I mean, you were talking about uh, looking up at the marquee, but was that the when you're in the arcade? Was that the first game you'd ever played, or what was the first game? I guess I had a two part question. What was the first game you played, and what's the first game that you remember playing that you really thought, "Wow, this is this is I something." Love, I I love the key games, uh, tank game. You know, yep. Key games became yep. uh, Atari. And and uh, there were some Atari key games relationship. I can't remember what it was, but that tank game with the maze uh, separating the tanks uh, was a huge influence. Um, not a stretch when you think about my layout uh, for the tank game in Tron, right? Yep. And, and the, the the you know the the I think the you know the notion of the the shot expiring after a couple of hits around the corner kind of thing, shoot around corners kind of thing. Um, I'm very influenced by that game. That was the game I put a lot of money into. Um, and um, the game, the, the, it, was a, it was a midway tank game that I thought was horrible. It was, huh. um, I want to say it was like M2 or some obscure thing like that that I thought was um, like, I, I, that's the game that I looked at and said, man, this thing needs help. These people need me. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't the, like the key games, you know, that game, was nothing to look at nothing to write home about but but at least it was really fun and yep. so um yeah that's uh we literally just had somebody drop off a key uh a games tank at the shop for repair because the monitor's out okay. so we've got and the, and the guy that brought it in I, I don't know when he picked it up it looks new i mean it's just amazingly clean game awesome. so awesome that would bring back fond memories to me. Send me pictures. I will. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so so my question is, and I think you mentioned one of them, but what are the games that you have in your collection at home? Um, okay, so I have, uh, I have, so I I own a lot of stuff, but I live ah. in, I live in twelve hundred square feet Ooh. in a in, <laughs> a in a high rise in downtown Chicago, uh, with two walls of floor to ceiling glass. Uh, and all, I took all the walls down. So it's a beautiful apartment and I have amazing views of Lake Michigan, but, uh, I have, I don't have a lot of wall space. So I have, and games typically need a place to yeah, go. They need a wall. They yeah. need a wall. So, <laughs> yeah. so I have a wall of, I have a wall with, let's see, one, two, three, four, about eight pinball machines in my living room. Nice. Um, I have a lot of other pinball machines that I have no place for. And I, and I, and I buy, I still buy. Um, you know, games. I bought a Deadpool, which is sitting brand new in the box at, at Stern somewhere. And uh, <laughs> I, so I have more, I have more games than I can have in my house, unfortunately. Um, something I don't have and, and, and aim to have at one, at some point in time are both um, uh, a Tron and a Spy Hunter. Mm. Because back, back in those days, uh, and I, I had for many years, I bought, I, I er, so we used to have this, we used to have this, this routine with uh, where we could buy when we owned Aladdin's Castle, we could call up and, and order in, in at at from engineering at Midway. We could call up Aladdin's Castle and or I'm sorry, not a, not Aladdin's when we owned uh, uh, Empire Distributing. So at that time, you know, Valley Midway is such a powerhouse. They owned they owned distribution, so they were making money on everybody's game, right? Because the Empire would distribute Atari product, they would distribute everybody's <laughs> product. Oh, wow. So they were making they were making money on everybody's product and including our own. And 
they owned, uh, of course, Valley Midway Manufacturing, Pinball and Video, and Empire Distributing, and Aladdin's Castles, right? So they had operations, distribution, and manufacturing. So it was, it, it was, a, it was a powerhouse. But, but the beauty of that is that, A, you could test at any Aladdin's Castle, piece of cake, send your game over, test it there, and you got, you know, you got... Um, um, you know, you could control the environment, know exactly what you were getting into. Uh, and then you could also call Empire and say, send me a brand new Missile Command. <laughs> you know, <laughs> send me a brand new Stargate. And so um, so we did. And, and we had, in engineering, we had a big, huge game room. And we would, we would get all the, everybody else's stuff to look at it, reverse engineer it, whatever. Yep. And, um, and so I took home a pristine. And then... And then the games would sit there for a year, and uh, they were basically brand new games. They got played, but they were brand new games. They weren't getting the, the wear and tear that they got on the street. And then we'd call the sales department and go, hey, you know that Stargate that's in the engineering lab? Are you guys going to do anything with that? And then they'd say, <laughs> no. And I said, oh, good. Can I get a price on that? And then, you know, so we would buy. So I bought. I bought a brand new Stargate for like 300 bucks. Oh, my nice. God. <laughs> <laughs> that was my, and that was, that was what, by the way, the Defender, uh, Defender and Stargate were, uh, and Robotron were some of my favorites. Um, from the time, I literally used to look at, um, and then, of course, you know, uh, Eugene and Larry are both uh, close friends of mine, and, and I, and I, I got to know them years later, but I I used to when when those games were new on the street, I used to look for w- what bars I would go to, on whether they had a defender or not. Uh, <laughs> that's so and there wow. was a guy, there was a there was a place where I used to go where there, that I'd gotten fairly good at the game, and there was a guy, there was another guy that drank at that same place that would hang out there. I ne- and I, I I never met him, but him and I were always knocking each other off the high score table. And the bartender knew this, so I'd walk in and he'd say, "Hey, he's got you again. You better get over there." <laughs> it's like a scam because you know I would be like, you know, we we're both uh, fighting for that for that coveted spot. So we so, had a couple. Well, go ahead, Brian. Well, I was just going to ask you, like, what what is your? You mentioned that you wanted a Tron and a Spy Hunter, but what is kind of the game? If you could have one game, what's the game you, that's your go to? Um, let's, like, let's let's make that a two part, arcade and pinball. Are, right? Are you talking about like that? I that I want to play all the time. So, so if you if you could only have one game to play, ever again, like a, like a desert what would island that pick. Be? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> wow, that's Man. that's impossible. <laughs> I don't even know. I can't, I couldn't answer that. Yeah, one. that's impossible. I mean, you know, I'll tell you, I'll tell you the deal. So, I think that certainly, certainly, my own. You know, I mean, games are, they're like music, you know, they have a yep. place in time and they, they, and especially the ones I work on, it's kind of like, I can, I can play those games and it'll take me right back to that time. I, I can tell you what was going on in my life. They, yep. I can tell you everything about, um, they, there's a feeling that goes with that, the blood, sweat and tears that took to make the thing, the fights, the you know, the, the making the game in spite of the company stuff, uh, all of that stuff uh, um, makes them incredibly memorable. I, uh, of the games that I own, that I play all the time, in my house I play I play my Monster Bash all the time. I love that pinball machine. Um, uh, lately I've been addicted to my own Deadpool. I haven't played uh, one of my own games as much as I've played Deadpool in years. I'm telling you this. I mean, I can't walk past the damn thing at work. Uh, I, I have to I have to play it. Um, video games, you know, I, I mean, I got into the consoles and there's I it's really difficult for me to tell you that. Yeah, I I I, I could only live with this one game. You know, I don't, I'm not sure. I have to think about that. I have to think about that. Although I have to say that that Stargate, I, I was a big fan of that Stargate. And I used to play that thing. For many years, I mean, literally, I owned it for, I, I don't own it anymore, I owned it for probably 25 years, and, and the, the thing um, sat in my living room, and I would randomly turn it on and play it. Nice. nice. I will say Brian Jones in the chat just commented and said that Lord of the Rings is a masterpiece, so kudos oh, to you. 
So we did have uh, actually somebody who I don't know if they're listening tonight, um, but it, so uh, they they mentioned this to us, us the other day. Uh, one of the guys that's a tech out on the East Coast mentioned to ask you about your observations uh, about kind of how Bally Midway Williams and Midway Games are managed or kind of the, the industry as a whole uh, was managed and kind of your thoughts on, on that. <laughs> Just kind of opening Pandora's box in some ways, but... Well, I think, you know, I think that, um, so, original Midway, I think, was, like, the Midway that I joined in 1984, I'm sorry, 1978, the Midway that I joined in 1978 was really a manufacturing company with very, with very little focus on um, the notion of creating games and, and the, the, the heart street group, which was the, you've heard that term. I think, um, if you have, if you've ever listened to Brian Cullen, you know, he talks about it all the time. Um, that was the group that we formed, you know, that there was basically the, you know, that was Bill Adams's group, uh, and it, you know, and, and him and I, and brought all these guys in and we started making games and, and, um, the, the, the fact that they were licensing products like like the Space Invaders and all of the Namco product, uh, and they were having such success with it, made it so that there was less focus on development. Um, and the contrast to that era would be Atari and Williams, where they lived and died by the stuff they made. There were, they weren't licensing that much stuff. I mean, Williams, everybody touched licensing. Atari did a little bit of it, and so did Williams. But it was not as they were more driven to innovate and create. Um, when I was a designer at Midway, I aspired to be a Williams or Atari designer. I always thought, I thought they were better than we were. I thought that and I and I knew of the freedom that they had to do the things they did. So, so I I have to tell you that that you know, like I I thought those guys were gods. I mean I and I and I thought we were just okay. And <laughs> that's when I was a midway designer at at uh, you know in, in the in the late seventies early eighties. Um, when I joined uh, when I finally joined uh, the the Williams Valley Midway Group, by then. Um, you know, the biggest contrast to me was that we, that company was incredibly product focused. That company was all about, you know, let's make the coolest shit we can. And, and the inmates really ran the asylum, right? So product development was the marketing department. Product development was the, I mean, no one told us what license to get or what to do or what to make. It was like, what do you want to do? And then, you know, designers would just say, I, I want to make this. I want to do that. Right. Mark Trammell was a huge basketball and, and football fan, huge sports fan. Right. That's why that's why those over the top games like NBA Jam and, and NFL Blitz were so freaking amazing because it was his passion. Right. About the game, knowing everything about it, all that. Right. Um, you know, Eugene with his cruising series. Right. All that stuff. It was like those guys wanted to make the stuff right and mm -hmm. and i you know i mean that's 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 and i finally got to a place where when i was there i felt like i finally got to a place where uh the talent of the designer is revered you know the the, the notion of a bunch of guys inventing <laughs> cool shit was revered <laughs> you know nice it's it, yeah. yeah i totally love that because we've had uh We've had Eugene on the show a couple times. We've also had um, Ed Rotberg and uh, Brian Cullen. So it's fun to have you to sort of tie in all these different things. One of the cool things is – I hired Brian, by the way. I gave Brian his first job in the business. Really? Yeah. Well, tell us a little <laughs> bit about that. Ah, that's a great story. So, <laughs> uh, so we – the name – the. The, 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 we used to refer to the development group as Heart Street because the company had, I, I told you about the three development groups, you know, DNA and Arlington Heights and Arcade Engineering in Fort Lauderdale. And when we had 
finally after after we did um, we had we had a couple of games under our belt, and the company said, you know, why don't we take this development group and you know give them their own space? You know, Bill had been fighting for you know get us out of the regular engineering because we really were kind of scattered throughout. Uh, midway engineering so we were running around the building to just talk to each other to meet and so bill kept saying you know you guys got to give us a space so they put us in this heart in this warehouse which was like a block from the company and it was on heart street that's where that comes from so um we were at heart street um i i was looking for more artists and uh, brian interviewed and so brian comes in and um, so, you know, he, he's it. I don't I think he was either right out of school or shortly out of school. He had gone to SIU and he uh, he is funny because, you know, he wanted a job so bad. And he <laughs> says to me, I said, I said, OK, uh, you know, it, and, it, you know, almost almost the exact same words that I heard you know, seven years earlier, whatever it was, you know, okay, you know, 300 bucks a week, when can you start? And, and he misheard me and he goes, 300 bucks a month. I'll take it. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's 300 bucks a week. <laughs> you know, but then, but then wait, it gets better. So then he walks out of my office and my, my office had was on a ground floor and there was, I had a, I had a, like one of these, it was a seventies building and it had this like skinny, tall glass wall, you know, window wall. And, and I look through the, through my slit the, of glass and there's this old car and I watch Brian get into the old car and then, uh, he closes the door and he takes uh, a dryer hose, you know, a white vinyl dryer hose and he puts it up to his face. And he pulls a rubber band around his the the back of his, <laughs> the back of his head. So he's like, and then he fires up the car and he drives away and he's wearing, you know, this hose, this giant, you know, dryer hose. And I'm like, I'm like, oh my god, what, what was have that? I done? Okay, I would I would call Brian <laughs> wait, next. Wait. I'm calling Brian next week. And I'm going to have him on the next show because not, this is hilarious. He will own it. He will own it. He, he will absolutely own it. So um, the, I'll tell you what the dry hose is about. <laughs> so, yeah, so please. I, I watch him drive away and I'm calling. I'm like, as I'm seeing this, I can't believe it. So I'm, I'm shouting down the hall. Guys, come in here. Everybody, come into my office. No, you got to see this. <laughs> Guys are coming in. What? What? It was a, look out the window. Look, the dude I just hired. He put a dryer hose to his face. It's like the worst huffing incident away. ever. Um. <laughs> All right. You want to hear what it's about? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So he had no money. He had a piece of shit beater car, old beater car. It had an exhaust leak. So he had to get fresh air while he drove this car so he wouldn't die. No. <laughs> Oh, that is hilarious. So, so he wouldn't poison himself with carbon monoxide poisoning. He wore the dryer hose, which fed, it was, it was like, it was hooked up to like some vent, you know, in the car and it would feed cold, fresh air to his face. Oh my God, that's so funny. That is hilarious. I'm, I'm, I'm telling you the truth. You can verify it, Brian, anytime you'd like. <laughs> we he owes me, so he's gonna be. Uh, we're calling him. We're calling him next week. Oh my god! Yeah, we should. It's <laughs> hilarious. True. Yeah, it's true. Oh, I almost peed my pants. <laughs> <laughs> oh, who had the next question? Was it Mark? <laughs> sure. Um, I think. I think you're very well respected in the arcade pinball industry. And I'm just looking for people that you were inspired by. Like, do you, do you have an idol? Who did you most respect? So, you know, I, I was really fortunate. Um, when I joined, um, when I joined, um, Williams, I, I had, uh, you know, I had designed a lot of stuff already. So I, I brought, I brought a skill set and 
and I brought a portfolio of, of stuff. Um, and some of these guys knew my stuff, right? So, uh, I knew, you know, uh, Pat Lawler, the pinball designer had worked at Dave Nutting and associates at the same time that I was at Midway. So he knew me and, um, and guys like Steve Ritchie, I had the office, you know, he had the office right across from me and Larry DeMar was down the hall. And so I think that, um, you know, I had a lot of respect for these guys. And I would say that, that I, I was, I was helped a lot by guys like, like Steve and Pat, uh, and Larry. Um, and I think that I went on to forge friendships with all those guys, uh, you know, Jarvis, all this. I mean, it was an amazing time, right. To mm-hmm. have all this talent, just walking the halls and screwing off, uh, you know, Ed Boone. I mean, just, just all these guys, right. And they were all there. We were all there. We were all doing our thing and we worked together for many years and I got, I got to, I, I think I have to tell you that I learned something from all of them. There's something from all of them. Um, and everybody, um, from, you know, a Boone, George Petro, uh, uh, I mean, the, the list goes on, you know, um, every, everybody, those guys, everybody there was so passionate about, uh, it gave me really, it gave me the model for how I run my studio today. Hmm. I, I, I run my studio today and I, and I'm, what I, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to build like, like keep the good, throw out the bad. Right. So I'm right. trying to not. You know, I have the luxury to to say, okay, I want this and I don't want that. So, so I'm I'm trying really hard. Um, there, you know, I mean, it wasn't it wasn't utopia over there. I mean, the, in pinball, it was like seven street gangs, you know, <laughs> and the street gangs were all like, you know, fighting for survival. So there were, you know, there was definitely there were there were designer politics. There were, you know, there was there was uh, a lot of, um, you know. Uh, do whatever it takes to make your game better and and more successful than the next guy. There was the competition at the time was really down the hall, not across the street, um, because we were that good, and and so, uh, you know, and and I guess the guy that asked the question earlier about the management styles of the two companies and the distinction, um, the fact that we we had that freedom and we had that comp- you know, the huge spirit of competition. Mm. I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to like in my studio today, I try to foster the fact that, Hey, you know what? We all need to be successful. We all need to help each other be successful because it's the company. If the company goes out of business or if we have a bad quarter, it, it, it affects all of us. It's going to fuck with all of us. It's not, mm. you know, it's not a, um, you know, it's not like my game's better than your game. It's like right, our games right. have to be, there has to be a standard. Mm-hmm. for all of our games and it has to be a standard that i think is based on that experience it's driven my bar is set pretty damn high because i lived in that place where all those guys are making amazing shit you know I so i i that's what i hope that's what i that's what i'm trying to do anyway I love perfect it. i love it awesome all right so let's 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 uh circle i'm gonna go all the way back you you talked about you got into the industry in the late seventies. Yep. What was the first game you played? I I think you know it's hard to say. I mean, I played um, as a kid. I played. I played. I would play pinball, but I didn't know kind of. You know, I didn't really know what. Like I did, you know. It's like I knew I liked this game better than that game, but I wasn't really sure why. Sure. I just sort of, you know, as a kid, you're just kind of beating the ball around, trying to keep it in play. Um, Were you drawn of, more to pinball or video games at that point? At that point, it was it was all pinball. When I was a kid, it was all pinball. I, so I, really, I, that's kind of cool because you joined Ballet Midway as sort of a video game guy, yeah, if, if you will. Yep. You ended up at Stern as the creative, you know, yep. chief, chief creative guy, yep. and now yep. and, and but but your real passion as a kid was pinball. It wasn't really a passion. It was I. I was a. I was at best a casual player. Okay. And I was. I was at best a casual player. Um, you know. I mean, when I was a kid, life was different, right? I mean, I was into my. I was into my bikes. 
you know, yeah. my stigmas and stuff like that. Oh. And I was like, you know, I had, a, you know, I, I, I played basketball. I, you know, I, I'd run, you know, I mean, I'd run around on my bikes and, and you know, I, I had, I, you know, I, I was uh, from the era of 12 inch GI Joes, right? I played with 12 inch GI Joes. I mean, that's yeah, the yeah, stuff. Yeah. I had slot cars, right? I loved slot cars. Oh, HO so... scale slot cars, huge. Yes. So, I mean, oh, nice. that was, I, so if you think about it in the context of today, right? Kids today are playing, you know, with their PlayStations and Xbox and stuff like that. They're playing Fortnite. Right. And I didn't have that, right? I didn't, it, it didn't exist. So I didn't play any of that. A pinball machine was sort of a rare, kind of a rare bird in and of itself because you had to have money to play it. So it right. was like, that was, you know, that was, that was different. And um, when I went to college is probably the first time I, and I interacted with, with video games when I was in, when I was in school. And I talked about that, that, that key games tank game. Mm-hmm. That was, that sucked a lot of quarters from me. Right. Mm-hmm. And I, and I remember, um, you know, I remember, uh, th- you know, I remember the gun, the midway gun games, the electromechanical. Yeah. Gun oh, games. yes. They're right, so, so beautiful. Played, uh, like, yeah. The... So I played a lot of those. Right. That when I was a kid, uh, like on a Saturday or something, if like my scout troop would have like a bowling day or something and we'd go to the bowling alley. And, and then, you know, after the after the function, after we stopped bowling or whatever, we'd go into the arcade of the bowling alley. There'd be those midway gun games. Yeah. And. And so those were um, like, I mean, if, I guess if you if you would if you were to say to me what kinds of coin operated stuff I played, that's yeah. what I played. I played do that you, stuff. Do you think that those in because those had uh, phosphorescent ink and black light? Do you think that in maybe influenced? <laughs> maybe so you know maybe subconsciously you know I mean you never know right? It's, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So I mean that was. Uh, I, so I, I played a lot of that stuff. I played, um, when I was in college, I played shuffle alleys, you know, we'd get around, we, you know, we, we'd go get beers, we'd play shuffle. Alley. That was a social game, right? Um, we'd play and video games and the, my first video games were basically between classes when I get my lunch in, in, in the, like this, like the student union kind of place. I played, um, I played Adam's family when I was this, for the same exact reason. It was in the commons at college. Yeah. Yeah. And it, and that's, you know, I mean, that's how I discovered them. It was that, that experience. I, I played, uh, I'm trying to think of games from that era. I played uh, Midway Gunfight. You remember that? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, it's so cool. So cool. Yeah. Midway Gunfight. Um, the baseball games, the pitching bats. I yeah, played a lot of awesome. those, right? I played those. I actually, I liked those as a kid. I remember the pitching bats. I liked those a lot when I was a kid. Yeah, yeah. Um, so now you got me thinking. Yeah, the gun games, the pitching bats, um, the occasional pinball. Like I think, um, oh, man, um, some of the some of the um, you know the I mean the thing about pinball when I was a kid is that the art was sort of a big attraction, right? Yeah. It was always like you know like lions and you know, cute like, girls i, I yeah. was like oh my Very, god yeah right. the cute girls yeah relationship yeah. goals <laughs> <laughs> we did have a question from the chat by the way brian is working on a gunfight right now brian jones is working on oh, a cool. gunfight uh uh one of the questions from the chat was uh and you you talked a little bit about what games did you work on well what wait he's you, you remember that the what's that Midway black black driver which one? Two eighty zap. Two eighty zap was a driving oh, game. I had oh, yeah. one of those. Black and white. I had yeah. one of those. Yeah. Yeah. That was a that was a that was a game I played in college. That's a great game. It was what and it had like all these weird you know like crash, zorg. Yeah. You know like okay, oh, yeah, totally. very odd. Um, but super really like first game you put a quarter into and you and it was a real rumble from a car right. It's like, brrr, it's, and that's like I call that the. Uh, Silver Age game, right? Or is it a Bronze Age game, right? So, uh, one of the questions from the chat was, what games, what, uh, of the, you talked about the, the, earlier in the show, uh, the games you worked on that were like, uh, electronic games and things like, what games would we know from that? Somebody asked. Uh, are you talking about the novelty games? The novelty games, yeah. Novelty games. So, um, the Hawk Avenger, you should look up. Okay. Helicopter okay. game. 
um, I, I did uh, the development work for a coin roll down called um, uh, uh, Rock and Bowl. Okay. Okay. It was kind of a kind of a, a stupid ticket spitter. Uh -huh. Not a very good game. Um, the very first Electrum Chemical game I did, I actually was at Midway. It was called Big Bat. It was a baseball game where you um, it fired a ball at you, a nylon, one inch nylon ball through the air, and you had you had this giant bat, and you and you you tried to hit the ball. Almost like pinball. Um, no, it wasn't a pinball. It was a uh, it was a novelty game. It was okay. like um, let's look up Midway Big Bat. Okay. Okay. Oh my God, that that cabinet is crazy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. that's right. I did that too. <laughs> and the flyer, the flyer is amazing. Like these, yeah. these kids, the the, right. the dog. Oh that's my God. Right. That's right. That's right. <laughs> big yeah. Okay, now I want. By the way, it was it was a horrible game. It was too hard. It was, <laughs> it's, yeah. it's a horrible game. Horrible game. <laughs> wow. I can't imagine. You know, it's funny is that. I can't believe they let me make that. <laughs> I'm, I know, right? It's it's so deep. It's like tall and deep. Right. Wow. Had pinball legs at one end. Right? Yeah. yeah. But so, I mean, it, it feels like a like a almost like a pinball platform. But yeah, not it wasn't. pinball. It was uh, like I said. The, I mean, the cool thing was that it fired this ball through the air. Yeah. So it was pitching the ball at you the way you know, just like real baseball. The, the bad news is it you know it's it's coming at 200 miles an hour. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> wow. Uh, wow. All right, well, uh, why don't we wrap up with one more question? I got a question for you. Uh, advice for young uh, designers out there and creative types. What I think they... um, you know, like pick a pick a thing that you you know that you really want to do, and it doesn't really matter what that thing is or what area of the business you want to be in, but, you know, uh, dig into it and, and, and try to, you know, try to, try to make yourself amazing at it and, or at least really good that somebody will pay attention to it. Um, it's perseverance. I mean, it, it's a tough, tough business, but it's, it's perseverance. And I think, I think the, the, the best advice is it doesn't matter what, what it is you're doing, uh, try to do something you really like. Because, man, I mean, we put so much of our lives into the stuff. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, you got to you gotta like what you're doing. I, um, I hear that. So, I hear that. Okay, I have two follow-up questions. So number one is, <clears throat> number one is, you got to come, will you come back on the show? <laughs> because sure. we, we just like scraped the tip of the iceberg tonight. This is fantastic. <laughs> Just, and, I'll yeah. bring props next time. <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice. Yeah. I guess that was only a one-part question. All right. All right. Well, <laughs> well done. <laughs> Thank you. I, 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 I will. I will send him a spy hunter seat for him coming back on the show. How's that? <laughs> there you go. A brand wow. new spy hunter seat that won't crack, at least for another <laughs> forty years. Uh, I think it'd be good, right? You guys, oh, oh, I remember what my other question was. Can you can you hang out with us for a couple minutes after the show? Sure. All right. So we're going to wrap this up tonight, but I want to thank all the chatters for hanging in there tonight. We've had a great time with you guys, and it's been an honor to have George on the show. So uh, we're closing out tonight a little late. We'll probably have to break this one up and do a couple episodes. What do you think, you guys? So. Sure. And now, if everybody's on the right page, we can we can plug the show. Well, thanks again for listening in to the Double R's. That's Arcade Radio. Like us at Facebook at Arcade Radio. Or check us out on the semi-regularly updated blog at ArcadeRadio.com. That's R-C-A-D-E-R-A-D-I-O.com. Uh, you can call and leave comments on the question line, which... Thank you for calling in tonight, guys. 612-548-GAME-4263. That's what game spells... All right. nice. You can subscribe to our YouTube channel, which hopefully you're watching right now, and click on that notification bell so you'll know when we're subscribing, uh, streaming rather, live. There you go. You, you can also subscribe to our podcast at Anchor FM, iTunes, Google Play Music, etc., etc., all over the universe. That's going to be it for the show from Arcade Radio. We hope you had a great time, and we'll see you on the next episode. As you were. As you were. My pants are coming off. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
Oh no! <laughs> Too comfortable. <laughs> oh, who wrote this? I don't know, but I've I've been listening to this 500 theme play for two hours behind me. <laughs> I'm like, ah. I, I often thought how many tickets I'd have if I drove with that theme pa- playing in the car while I'm driving. You know, just, uh, was I going 100? <laughs> Yeah, oh, it's I, got the good parts. I had so many more questions about Spy Hunter, but I didn't ask them. But that's okay. That's okay. We, you we know, do a whole Spy Hunter show. I think yeah. that'll be fun. Oh, Actually, you know oh yeah. You've never seen. Um, so I pitched my last summer at Midway, right before they closed the company. Um, I pitched a new Spy Hunter by me. So you know, because a lot of Spy Hunters were made for the consoles that yeah, I yeah. had nothing to do with, right? So I, I pitched a console spy hunter and I have a bunch of the sizzle uh, videos and things that I made. Um, and so I'd love, I, you know, I'd show, show you guys that. Oh, that we um, should we should do that. Stuff. We should do that and like get all the pictures out there so people can watch it. I'd be yep. super awesome. All right, let's, let's shut this thing down, guys. Everybody's dancing, right? Everybody's dancing? <laughs> That's what I thought. I don't really dance. Oh, oh hello? Oh.